And so it's to Liège in Belgium, Belgium's third biggest city with an habitation of 190,000 for the prologue time trial. This is the River Mars. It stretches through three countries here in this part of Western Europe. But for everybody today, they're staying in Liège as they line up to watch now in their thousands the start of the progress rather of the prologue time trial. In the start house, Paul, Tyler Farrer, who won a stage last year in this race in Redon. And one of the rare riders, Phil, who's managed to win a stage in each of the Grand Tours, the Tour of Italy, the Tour de France, and of course, the Tour of Spain. But here, this is not his speciality, but as all of the sprinters will do, Phil, they'll try and do their best in this violent start to the Tour de France with the hope of a yellow jersey, possibly in the first week of racing. Big hopes for the American as he launches now. He's searching for the top form. He's a sprinter, really, but he'll want to show us today. He's in the mix as we start our journey across the part of Belgium into France. So Tyler Farah, sports the first time seen on television or anywhere in the world for that matter the new colors of the Garmin Sharp team so as he gets underway now Tyler Farrer basically a sprinter that's how he grabs his victories normally he's a stage winner in all of the three Grand Tours the Grand Tours are the Tour of Italy, Tour of Spain and of course the Tour de France well uh, eighth place uh, in the Tour de France uh, green jersey competition you know this year so far Phil he hasn't actually won himself a race he was second overall in the Tour of Qatar and that is a bit of a shock to me because he is an aggressive rider but he'll be looking for a win in the first week of the Tour well, this is Adam Hansen an Australian from Queensland now he's riding on the Lotto Bellisol team he's back in the Tour de France uh, finally he was on the HTC team alongside Mark Cavendish new team and now settling down back in the Tour de France the best time remains at the finish of Andre Grifko he's a very early starter he started today in the fourth place of the riders and he's holding on to best time well Phil there's confirmation you can see uh, Marcel Kittel uh, again a sprinter is in second place he's looking for six seconds but uh, we're back here on board the uh, Garmin Sharp which is a brand new sponsor that's come in just before the start of the Tour de France for this a big American squad and we're looking here at Tyler Farah the crowds came in this morning in their waves it was really remarkable to see I really don't know where they came from well hey Paul this is Belgium as you know it's the hotbed of cycling this is their number one sport here in Belgium as we're watching Tyler Farah out on course a chance to see the course here we have locked down the city of Liège today I don't know how anybody who's not watching the Tour de France can make any progress at all we have locked down outside all of the major seats you'll see shortly we run down the side of the River Mars on the quays there as we switch back to Adam Hansen who isn't a bad time trialist he's the ex-champion of Australia and he's also the ex-champion of the Crocodile Trophy which is a big long mountain break bike race up in the northern part of Australia but for him and his team Phil we talk about Team Sky having a complicated tactical approach to this year's Tour de France this team is also looking for a high place in the overall standings with Jürgen Vandenbroek and of course stage victories with Andre Greipel Adam Hansel, Hansen gritting his teeth here trying to squeeze tenths of a second that really will count in this short prologue time trial it's only four miles you see that uh, yellow and green flash on his sleeve indicating a past champion of the time trial which he was in 2008 uh, 7 for 28 is the best time a little bit off the pace there as Hansen crosses the line yeah but for these guys they're just getting this first uh, ride out of the way so the grimace of Adam Hansen he's 30 uh, years of age right now turned 31 in fact in May this year uh, so Hansen now can take the rest of the day off before we start the tour proper tomorrow that's the situation at the moment early start of the day Andre Grifko is holding on to the lead with 7 minutes 28 seconds in now is Daniel Oss he's the lead out man in this race uh, for the sprinters including a Peter Sagan as he comes up too but uh, like all of these riders Paul sprinters are fast over short distances well they are they're very explosive and especially on these uh, 180 degree turns that we've got scattered around the course here this afternoon it's a question of slowing down and getting right back up to top speed as quickly as possible but I do really believe that this course this afternoon suits Fabian Cancellara all right well as we look around here this is the provincial palace here which is in the place saint labeur where the race uh, goes across at about the halfway point in uh, in the stage today and the beauty it is we're now back out on course this is jens void on course and jens riding his 15th tour de france but his teammate is chris warner who came in at the late call up uh, he replaced the injured andy Sleck earlier today craig hummer was talking with him Chris, on paper at least, people are calling this a technical course. You just were, had a chance to ride it. How'd you find it? 
I think it's a fun course. I don't know about real technical. Certainly there's two hard roundabouts you gotta be careful of, but a lot of the turns seem pretty fast. Certainly Cancellara is going to be going fast. You might have to be a little more careful. But I think for me, it'd be most of the turns are full gas. But it's kind of like when you're coming over a riser and you can't really see what's around the corner, so you're a little scared to hold back. And But I think most of them are full gas. You just got to have a little faith to do the course a few times, have some faith that the corner is going to open up as you come into it. For a GC contender like yourself, is it hard to dial it back just a little bit knowing that not only you have three weeks ahead, but as you said, there's other fish to fry? For me, it's no problem because I, I know in order to go on GC good, top, top GC, I got to find some time someplace else. So the main thing about today is really just don't crash. Lose, uh, maybe I give up five seconds being a little careful here or there in a couple of roundabouts, but it's not a, it's, I'm not going to win here or lose here or anything. So it's just get through it, enjoy the moment. You had a Tour de France, great crowds out there, it's, it's, it's packed all the way around, and we're just training right now. So by come race time, it's going to be full. I asked you this question a couple days ago, but how eager are you to finally toe the line and go down that start ramp today? Yeah, I'm ready to go. This is a big month, so starting here at the tour and then going into the Olympics. My wife coming, of course, for the end of the tour and then following me over to the Olympics. So it's going to be a fun month. I'm going to enjoy the whole time. Thanks. Yes, you'll never dampen the enthusiasm of Chris Horner. He's coming up 41 years of age. Now, Karsten Kruen is out on course now. Still, it's the champion of the Ukraine, Andrei Grivko, early to start, who heads up that leaderboard. Now, occasionally, we will get the pictures seizing up like this. There's nothing wrong with your television. It's to do with the buildings around and the live uh, waves going up to the helicopters for the live pictures. Look at this crowd, Paul, all the way around. Well, this is Jens Voigt now uh, fighting with his bike. This man battles his machine all of the time. Uh, he's a very good time trialist, and he's a, an explosive bike rider too, when you bear in mind that he clocks in at 39 years of age. But the crowd that have turned out here in Liège today is quite remarkable. I think the organisation were a little bit upset. They didn't feel there were that many people turned up to the team presentation the other night, but I think today they will be happy. Yes, well, they've come flooding in. We're not very far away from a number of countries in this part of Belgium, including Holland, which is literally less than half an hour's drive away, and Germany, and, of course, Luxembourg. And, of course, this is a strange part of uh, Belgium because uh, it's known as the Wallonia region, but, in fact, there are two different uh, languages here. We predominantly French, but, you know, they do also speak German here. And that's what Jens Voigt wants to see. Mind you, the numerals are the same in both languages as he now looks up towards the clock and drives in towards the finish. 7.21. It's a good ride by Jens. 7.28 is best time. He's realised it. That's why he's got out of the saddle to try and rip over the line. It's just slipped by and he just comes over the line. Uh, 7.32 he might get there as Voigt crosses the line. A very, very good effort uh, for the ageing Jens Voigt. He is a remarkable guy. He certainly is. I might have uh, led you astray there Phil because in fact he's 40 years of age all right well, so we're looking down here at the station which is one of the most modern in this town of a great uh, historical effect we'll take another break Jens Voigt is in with the second best time just four seconds off the lead of Andrei Grifko As we look down here on the Provincial Palace, which is the home of the Governor of the Province of Liège here in Belgium. And we're waiting now to see if anybody can get up and beat the time of André Grivko. As we move out on course here at the moment, we're picking up with Chris Froome of Team Sky uh, out on course. No, I'm sorry about that, that's the wrong number. Uh, this looks like we're actually now with Bert Grabs, who is the former world champion of the time trial. Bert uh, is now 37 years of age as uh, as he now settles down to what he hopes will be a good performance today. Related to Alan Gallopa, who's part of the, uh, of the team, but that's not the reason that he's in this uh, year's Tour de France. He's here purely on his merit. Gallopa is a very, very fast sprinter when he comes down to the bunch sprints. We'll see about that over the next few days, I guess. But right now, it's not a bad ride, is it? but the sprinters can ride these short time trials. About 7 minutes 41 as he crosses the line there, so uh, that's not going to slot him in amongst the leaders. There's no change overall. We've missed nothing. Grifko is still on top. 
top david miller second of the garmin the sharp team and steve cummings is there in third place now let's have a look at our road id challenge fan prediction see who you thought would win today's stage and take a look at that hey you're going for pavian cancellara 21 percent brad wiggins i'm surprised it's only 11 cadell evans eight that's about right and peter sagon only five percent hey watch out sagan is good believe me head on over to roadid.com forward slash ride to make your prediction for tomorrow's stage and you'll be entered to win daily prizes and a 2013 trek madone so that's a competition to the game to look forward to anyway as you can pick tomorrow's stage winner i hope it's a high speed train back out on course uh, the crowd has really shown the colors today uh, as Paul Sherman has said a little disappointed by the people that turned out uh, for the prize presentation on Thursday but today they've made up for it they're here to watch the show we've met many many Australians Americans uh, South Africans all here to enjoy the splendor of three weeks of the Tour de France well high-speed trains are all that this is at region is all about and Brent Lancaster out on course is an extremely fast man when it comes to individual time trialing the the railway station of Liège is not too far away Phil and it uh, hosts the arrival of the high-speed train which goes from Paris all the way across to Cologne and I wonder about this man because Lancaster is a very fast man and he's formerly been a great about 60 seconds it will take him to cover one kilometer Phil so it very well could be that we could be seeing a brand new time well Brett Lancaster is no stranger to winning at the first day he won the prologue of the Tour of Italy and wore the pink jersey for just the one day in 2005 he's heading up now towards the finish Thibaut Pino for, for FDJ he is out on course as well as the riders now complete the distance well uh, Pino out on course for FDJ but Brett Lancaster went through the first time check Phil with the fastest time three seconds faster than Andre Grivko so we could very certainly be seeing a brand new best time for Orica Green Edge the Australian squad because Lancaster is a specialist at the solo effort here he is well Orica Green Edge the all Australian team in the race not all Australian riders I hasten to add but they are in the race and this is very much one of a record entry of 12 Australians in the Tour de France this year now can Lancaster deliver I think he might be able to he's done it before in the prologue as we look for 728 720 he's in Brent Lancaster is the new leader what a great start 7 at 24.99 51.8 kilometers an hour that's about 32 and a half miles an hour Lancaster has refound his old form he turned pro back in 2002 yes he's a great time trialist a great man from the track and now he has set the bar that little bit higher Wow, well, Brett Lancaster won the prologue of the Giro d'Italia in 2005, then he broke his collarbone in the circuit of the Sarth the following year. He's now looking like he's back on form. 7.20. Yep, he's, uh, I think he'd be happy with that ride. Uh, all these riders, it's the excitement of the first participation in the Fort Tour de France, Phil, but it's also the fear and trepidation because it's the most difficult event that any of these youngsters will have ever done in their lives. They've ridden 10-day sure. races, 14-day races, but when you come to the Tour de France, you never know how your body is going to handle the last week of this three-week event getting back out on course and once again now we're picking up uh, Andre Greipel here and you can see by the way those shoulders are rolling this is not an easy ride for him and he's not saving any energy for his sprints he's pushing on he's a big winner of the year Andre Greipel he's well known in Australia for his complete victories in the, the Australian Santos Tour Down Under now he's here not far away from his native Germany as once more we move out now to Boysenhagen uh, and Eddie is now looking for a good time and expected he did lose his time trial uh, title a week ago Paul but he's still a great time trial rider he has just gone through the first time check with exactly the same time as Brett Lancaster almost to the second almost to the hundredths of a second so this will be an interesting time by the youngster from Norway well, we're saying it's Boysen Hagen, if it is, he's wearing the number of Chris Froome here, Paul, but it, uh, it is Boysen Hagen, so there's a switch of numbers there, and I don't know whose fault that would be, but it may be the team's from the ring number. Anyway, 
Uh, he, the way he's riding here, he's really driving. This is across the Place uh, Saint Lambert again. It's a nasty. Had it been wet here, this uh, uh, Place would have been very slippery indeed. And it's a full left turn there before he straightens up to head towards the finish. It's a couple of k to go. Well, this is the uh, struggle position of Andre Greipel, but watch out for those powerful thighs and calves of his when it comes to exploding into the finishing straights at speeds approaching 65 to 70 kilometers now, almost 45 miles an hour. His top end sprint is looking at his position here, Phil. Uh, it looks to me as if he struggled out on the course. He wasn't in the top 10 when he came through the first time check, so I would not expect a top time by Andre Greipel here this afternoon. It's the Boyce and Hagen's time. We won zero time, same as Lancaster at the check while we swing up towards the finish now this is Andre Greipel coming through uh, Greipel I don't think is going to affect the leaderboard here as we go back to the man who's carrying the number of Chris Froome uh, but it is Edward Boysenhagen and he could well be the new best time when he arrives at the finish well that's very very strange he's almost uh, getting himself onto the tail of Andre Greipel here who actually has done a pretty impressive time he's got to beat the time of Brett Lancaster 7.24 but the clock continues to tick by here as this man from Germany battles with his machine and I really am a little bit surprised at this uh, interesting change of numbers because it says Bosenhagen on his number but in all of the race manuals it said he should be wearing number 102 <laughs> that's a first for the Tour de France for me anyway Andre Greipel crosses the line at 7 minutes and 36 seconds and just on 12 seconds off the pace of Brett Lancaster I have a feeling though that where this man is right now as we pick him up the time of Brett Lancaster will stand for no more as Bosenhagen heads up towards the finishing line 500 minutes meters is going to take him approximately 30 seconds to cover that because these riders are riding at an average speed of 60 kilometers an hour in the final hour of the race he's been in the saddle for seven minutes and five seconds this is going to be a pretty impressive ride by Bosenhagen the time of Lancaster 724.99 he was two tenths of a second slower than Lancaster at the check has he found the difference to take it he heads up towards the line 724 the time to beat he gets it just on the line 724.32 against 724.99 0.67 of a second gives it to the man from Norway and Team Sky Pro Cycling well look at that Edvald Boysenhagen just creeps under the radar and gets the best time there but only by about six hundredths of a second there it is 724 in the, for world cycling times it's the same time for Brett Lancaster four seconds to Grifko Miller down to fourth Steve Cummings down to fifth but we have a new leader as we go to a commercial break come back so they're probably warming up as we speak the standings at the moment is that Boysenhagen still lead on the same time as Brett Lancaster but Boysenhagen would be the winner if it came down to the split to tenths of a second Grifko who was the leader is now down into third place at the moment as we rejoin the action here out on course at the moment this is uh, Stu O'Grady settling down for the Orica Green Edge team on course now so as we gaze out across the city of Liège here now we move slowly through the field here there's no change in the overall Boysenhagen of Team Sky as we look at the Australian Studio Grady now Paul who's settling down uh, P2 he's got 16 tours in those legs now and that is a tremendous score for him and his name for the London Olympics so he's not going home to Australia at the end of this tour and he certainly is not uh, he's really the captain on the road if you like here Phil when you talk about Stuart O'Grady he's the man he's the brains in the event as we now go a little bit further down this man was formerly the champion of Spain in the individual time trial Jose Ivan Gutierrez Yes, former time trial champion as well as Gutierrez gets underway for Movistar. We'll see a lot of this team, I think. They've got two players for overall in Alejandro Valverde and uh, the man that just won the Tour of Switzerland. And now he's pulled his... I think he pulled his foot off the pedal, though. He might get a shot of that again. Uh, but he settled in quickly. No, we haven't. We switched, uh, switched shots here. Uh, so as we move further around the course. This is Heimar Zubeldia of Radio, Radio Shack Nissan. He's finished in the top ten in the Tour de France. Interesting tactics, I think, we're going to see on board Radio Shack. Jack Nissan over the next couple of weeks Phil, because they don't really have a dedicated overall leader is it going to be Zubeldia is it going to be uh, Chris Horner or will it be Frank Schleck the riders pick 
from talking to one or two of the riders there before the start this morning, Phil, is that Frank Schleck is actually holding some very good form. That's what they say, and he's diverted all attention from him by saying that uh, he doesn't want to be the team leader. So uh, we'll see as uh, go the hundredth man to leave the start house at the 198 mark Cavendish the world road race champion a winner of 20 stages of the Tour de France uh, but none of them time trials as Mark now makes his roll out here and if you think he looks as though he's lost weight he has he's actually nine pounds lighter than he usually is and that's part of his preparation he thinks for the upcoming uh, uh, Olympic Games uh, which will be in London just a week after this and there he is Mark Cavendish always saluting the sky first ever British man to win at the green jersey of the Tour de France and he did it last year and he was all smart he said not going to try and defend it this year he then went on to win the road race championship of the world which he did in Denmark towards the end of last season another great moment in his life and he hopes in three weeks time four weeks time actually he'll get a gold medal in the Olympic Games now we are hearing that Cavendish for some reason switched bib numbers with Edward Boysenhagen so I'm not too sure what's going on because Cavendish is on our start this is wearing 103 well in the 40th year of my coverage I've never known that before I'm totally confused but I hope you're not I'm just saying Paul that apparently Cavendish has switched bib numbers as well now so we'll have to get a new start list because he's wearing the number of Edward Boysenhagen who's got the best time and he's finished this could very well be a tactic by Team Sky to confuse <laughs> the opposition because I've never seen anything like this. And let's just check that flag was upside down, by the way. I'm not sure if you noticed the, the Union flag, as it's called. You can't call it a Union Jack unless it's sailing off the back of a ship. Jose Ivan Gutierrez now. Not a bad ride here by the former under-23 world time trial champion. Well, as Gutierrez comes up, it's a good ride. We expected that from the former time trial champion of Spain, but it slots him in in 21st place, 7.39 in the start house. Philippe Gilbert, 24 wins uh, last year. Hasn't shown that same form, but he's got it right because a week ago he became the time trial champion of Belgium. Big moment for a Belgian rider in the champion's jersey right here in his own country. Well, he's the champion of the individual time trial, but I would think, Phil, he is thinking about tomorrow because there are a lot of people who have said that the race organization here in Liège made tomorrow's finish tailor-made type of finish for Philippe Gilbert but that was the Philippe Gilbert of 12 months ago yes. I wonder if he has timed his form exactly to be right for tomorrow well he did it last year we had a similar finish at Les Alouettes last year and he shot up the mountain and just pipped Cadell Evans to the line so similar finish in uh, a Saran tomorrow which is only about four miles from where we're sat which is about seven kilometers away uh, so they've all had a good look at the finishing line believe me over the last two days they know what is coming at them uh, so it won't be a surprise perhaps like it was last year he is a French speaking Belgium he was born in Remouchon which is 25 kilometers or 15 miles away from here at the foot of the very famous Côte de la Redoute which is one of the most important climbs in one of the oldest races in the world the Liège Baston Liège well I guess the crowd has recognized him A little bit of a freeze on the picture there as we go into the trees which is stopping the signals up to the helicopters above as uh, Philippe Gilbert gets underway we'll get a time on him he is a very good time tries I'm not sure whether you can live with that incredible time that we've seen now from Sylvain Chavanel which is the best time at 7.20 it's also the best time at the Czech uh, as well at approximately half distance which is 3.35 well, the original railway station uh, in uh, Liègeville was built in 1842, but it was severely damaged in 1960. This one was just built uh, about uh, seven years ago to host the arrival of the high-speed train from France on its way to Cologne. Well, it is impressive. I'm sure the snowboarders would love to come off that roof and uh, jump down the bottom. Uh, but as we watch the watching the pictures there of the station we're back out on course now with Philippe Gilbert who continues to go through this corridor of noise everybody recognizing their national champion but you know this is a very international uh, crowd of spectators we have met a lot of people from the United States from Australia from South Africa from New Zealand we have a, a New Zealand rider Greg Henderson in this race amazingly it's his first ever Tour de France I can't believe it. he's been around so long uh, we'll be seeing him start as well 
The amazing thing is, Phil, uh, this is a country divided by a language, uh, mainly two languages, uh, Flemish and French, although there is a little bit of German spoken in the eastern part of the province of Liège. This man waves the flag for the whole of Belgium as a country. He speaks Flemish, he speaks French, Ooh. and he speaks pretty good English. Pierre Just Roland, wondered, yeah. a bit gingerly there going around that corner. Oh, oh, what a great time. We've lost our pictures, and you may have done it home. We went under a tunnel, I think that's why. He looked uh, very, very much as though he was going into that round about there far too quickly. This is the big circle. Look at that. Flick to the ref, flick to the right. Stick your knee out and hope you get round this corner. That's where Roland went round, and he had problems. That was the aggressive entrance into a corner by Philippe Gilbert. He is he's really pushing himself here because of the crowd. He knows he's respecting the home crowd here from Wallonia, from the Wallonie. He's a French-speaking Belgian, but he's wearing on his back the colours of the, of the Belgian flag. 6.4 kilometers it, it's such a short explosive effort you can't take any time out to uh, just relax a little bit to recover from the effort you're right in to what we call the red zone from the minute you leave the start house uh, you've got to find that little bit extra on the day Pierre Hollande, may, yes, he won the Alpe d'Huez stage of the Tour de France last year, but probably the biggest title for him, Phil, was being the best young rider in the Tour de France as well, and that was a title he was very, very happy to take. Back to the start house now as we catch up with Janic Brakjevic, as uh, he's another man that's moved on uh, this year, uh, Brakjevic, he used to race under Johan Brunil, and now he's gone on uh, to ride with the Astana team here. Astana, by the way, is uh, the capital of Kazakhstan, which... Uh, uh, keeps the sponsorship from that country and uh, he I would we'll find out who leads this team but I think that uh, Yakovic could be the leader Alexander Vinokurov is back that surprises a lot of people but I don't think he wanted to leave the sport last year with the crash he had which is very severe so it's almost certainly uh, Alexander Vinokurov's final tour de France well, Philippe Gilbert is going round these corners, Phil, like a man <laughs> possessed. He's gone through with the second best time there at the first 3.2 kilometre time check. Two seconds adrift. Well, it's only two seconds. You can make up two seconds, especially when the crowd are riding the bike with you as he goes on towards the finish now. Uh, Philippe Gilbert second at two seconds. He may or may not know that, uh, but the crowd will just shout him all the way. The adrenaline must be coursing through those veins now. I would believe that and all of these Belgian supporters here, Phil, are actually shouting on his back because they're keeping all that wind on his shoulder now, pushing him faster and faster. He's getting up. He's actually sprinting out of these corners as if he was going to win the stage in a bunch sprint here this afternoon. He wants to get the best time. He knows he's got to beat Sylvain Chavanel. 3.35 as he goes past the Palace of saint Lambert. Well, the Frenchman leads on the Belgian team, and now the Belgian, the champion, is trying to take him off the top of the leaderboard. They're on rival teams. This is the team now of Cadell Evans. Cadell Evans has strengthened his team through the winter so he can try and win the Tour de France again. And this is one of the men he chose to ride with. Phil, as an ex-professional cyclist, I can see the emergency, the energy that this man is putting into his pedaling style. He really is pushing himself. He's pushing everything to the limit as we go back to Pierre Hollande. Pierre Hollande has not done a great time here this afternoon. He's a climber. He's a man for the high spots of the Tour de France. Here, he's on the defensive. Uh, very much so, but he's conceding less than a minute to riders he may not respect when the high mountains come. But Pierre Roland comes in 103rd there. That's almost last of the riders who has started. But Philippe Gilbert certainly is going to be challenging for that first place. He's looking to close two seconds to take the lead away from Chavanel. And either way, he would be up above Boysenhagen and Brett Lancaster at worst in second place. He has to do a good ride today because tomorrow is the finisher it's a one kilometer uphill finish and if he can get himself to the top end of the leaderboard here this afternoon he could be dreaming about a yellow jersey on his shoulders in Belgium that's why he's riding like a man possessed plus of course he knows 90% of this crowd filled there on his side but he lives literally just down the road from Liège he knows these roads better than anybody else in the Tour de France and are there be anybody else in town as we're watching Philippe Gilbert Chris Horner's also just finished there as we're now waiting to see the arrival so he's closed the gap on Horner 
Uh, they started a minute apart and there's no way they're remotely like that right now as they go down now we will get to see the leaderboard look at the face of Gilbert look at the clock 7.04 and the time to beat is 7.20 this is going to be a huge effort by the time trial champion of Belgium he might just pip Sylvain Chabonel on the line it's going to be desperately close 18, 19, 20 hits the line in second place he comes in at 7.24 the clock hasn't actually stopped going uh, but I think it was second best uh, no he's dropped away in fact he slowed he slowed right down Paul you're right fourth best time for um, Philippe Gilbert but that's a good performance by this man I have to say losing five seconds so it uh, he must have slowed just that little bit over the uh, most of the corners on the back half of the of the course and the, it looks as like the crowd didn't have the effect I thought it would have had uh, for Felicia sign his form is perhaps not as good as we thought but as we continue to start here with the riders we're heading closer and closer towards the men who might be able to uh, to alter the overall leaderboard here's our old favorite Pierre Pedrigo here three-time stage winner in the Tour de France one of the top Frenchmen on the Francais de Jeux team and not a likely candidate for the win today or indeed the overall win but who is Ivan Basso is just up the road a couple of minutes ahead of him uh, we're getting ever so close now to see the start of George Hincapie who is making history today to becoming the first cyclist ever to do 17 tours de France absolutely incredible a big George will take us I'm sure all the way around to Paris as well uh, this is his last season as a cyclist and I don't know what we're going to do without uh, George Hincapie Cappy in the peloton. Cappy. So as we see Maxime Monfort on course now. Uh, George Hincapie now in at the start house 17th career Tour de France ball it's a record the Tour de France George I think has stayed in the sport to do just that well you know this is his second record of the year because he participated and finished the Tour of Flanders for the 17th time this year he's 39 years of age just the other day in fact yesterday was his birthday George Hincapie he's a good time trialist and I tell you what this is an amazing record he's beating the record of Job Zotemelk who himself was a man who had a very very long Long career. Yes, the Dutchman Jörg Zutabelk rode 16 tours and finished every one. That's why George couldn't claim first place uh, when he'd only done 16. So he had to hang around and do 17. Nobody's done that. George has the record. And uh, this year, George Hincapi will retire, which is, a, uh, as I say, a great loss to the world of cycling. I'm sure he won't be lost to the sports, especially American cycling, where he's well loved uh, as, and he's been American champion as well. Maxi of a kick out the back wheel there for Ivan Basso. Again, Phil, very, very lucky for the organisation here. Uh, losing himself 10 seconds at half distance, uh, Ivan Basso in 31st place, but for him, he's looking a lot further down the road. But again, the organisation very lucky that the range kept away. Absolutely. Well, there he goes. Levi Leipheimer moves up onto the starting house here he waits for his call he will start at 36 minutes past the hour so he's very very close indeed to his start so let's remember to keep up with the Tour de France you'll need the most advanced digital experience of its kind so go to nbcsports.com slash tv tdf live and get champion Tony Martin here the pressure's on he would love to win this as he now awaits the final count so the cheers of the crowd it is uh, Germany's literally just around the corner here the all-white man in the world champion uh, strip is Tony Martin now he's underway it'll be interesting to see how he tackles this because he's looking to challenge the time at the first check of Chavanel's 335 and remember Paul he goes so far ahead of Fabian Cancellara Cancellara will know his time before he starts that is a big advantage for the man from Switzerland Fabian Cancellara who will be the outgoing Olympic champion from Beijing uh, when we go to London 2012 and back Cancellara has made no bones about the fact he wants to win that title for a second time and he knows the biggest challenger in London is going to be this man here well that man there and of course that Tony Martin the German world champion
Alexander Vinokurov, the veteran of the Tour de France. He's known every aspect of the sport, from drugs through to winning many big races, and now riding without doubt his last Tour de France. Last year we saw him crash out, helped out of a ditch and couldn't put any weight on his body at all. Now he didn't want to leave the sport like that. He's come back for his final tour. Yep, 38 years of age, Alexander Vinokurov. He broke his femur in that very nasty accident in the Tour de France last year, and he was going to make that his retirement year, but that's why he decided he couldn't leave the sport like that by the back door, so he's fought his way back up to the top end of the sport, and Tony Martin now, Phil, is riding a very fast individual time trial. We'll get an indication at 3.2 kilometres. It's always deceptive to watch Tony Martin because he uses a massive gear compared to riders like Fabian Cancellara, who have a much higher cadence in their pedaling style. Well, Tony Martin knows that a victory in the time trial will automatically give him a yellow jersey. That is his dream because he was really left on a limb. We're looking behind the scenes at Cadell Evans here. Boy, he's got more sweat coming off his face than Niagara Falls there as he warms up now uh, for the final shot. He's the last man to go of 198. He is the defending champion. Because of the shortness of the course, Paul, it is so important you get that heart rate up as you come to the line. Yeah, you... Well, he chases the 17th and last man to go eventually. Alessandro Valverde here is now in. Made his comeback uh, in uh, this year in the Santos Tour Down Under where he took second place. His season has been a mixed one. He's had some good results. I feel in the Tour of Switzerland, he spent all of his time helping his teammate win it, Rui Costa. Now it might be time for a payback from Rui to help Alessandro win this. Well, tomorrow, he's a name that could come up to the top because it's a one-kilometre uphill finish tomorrow. It's going to be a finish for a strong man. But why not Alejandro Valverde, who beat Simon Gerrans to the line in the Santos Tour Down Under at the top of Alwalanga Hill, as they say in the Australia. Alwalanga Hill, yes, a nasty little climb, and they climbed it right to the finish. Well, he's on course now, he, where he rides for the Spanish uh, Movistar team. And yeah, the crowd are really warming to the occasion now, but it's been a long time since Sylvain Chabanel finished. He's had to sit behind the finishing area as we're watching Frank Schleck coming up. And we're not watching a great report here coming in from Frank Schleck. You know, he won at the Tour of Switzerland once in a time trial on the last day, but he really can't ride a time trial. And see, he's just about outside the top 114th on the line for Frank Schleck. And in four miles of racing, he's lost half a minute. And that means a big chunk of time off a lot of other of his main contenders. This is the man, though, Phil, a lot of people think could be the winner. He's gone through in exactly the same time as his teammate at 3.2 kilometres, Sylvain Chabanel. So Sylvain Chabanel goes through, and uh, we see the arrival of TJ Van Garden. We expected a good ride off Van Garden. It's not going to be the best, but it's going to be right up amongst it as TJ Van Garden hits the line with a terrific time. Second best. That's a great ride from TJ, and Cadell Evans will be absolutely delighted with his new teammate. This guy came to prominence, and oh, oh this what's Tony happening Martin's out on course? A problem. There's a problem with oh. his machine, and that has lost the prologue time. I bet you He's lost 20 seconds there with a bike change the world champion will not win the prologue this afternoon he was gone through on the sand he's got a problem with this bike no, it's a replay, oh, sorry, it's a replay. It's a replay. I was something the jumped check. in there, something jumped in there and he knew almost immediately he couldn't even think about what was going to happen, he had to change his bike, he was cool enough well. though to put his hand up to indicate to the mechanic, I've got him to get a new bike right now, but his prologue is over. And I'd give you 20 seconds there Paul, I reckon that's what he's lost, he went through with the same time as Chavanel, but not quite as quick in split second, as we watch Scratch Gretsch coming in now, another good ride here as they race towards the line, but it's going to be a tight one. I remember this man, he won in the USA Pro Cycling Challenge, the prologue in Colorado Springs last year, and it's not a bad ride. Fifth place for him as he hits the line. TJ Van Garden has upset the leaderboard at the moment. He's just arrived in second. Well, it's all happening right now. The world champion has lost the prologue. He can't possibly recover from this when every, not just second, but tenths of a second counts now. Uh, I reckon he probably lost, as Paul said, 20 seconds on that bike change. If you want a dark horse, 
name in the Tour de France this year. Well, I'll utter the name Denny Menshoff for Team Katusha. He's the Russian time trial champion. He won that title just about a week ago. And a lot of people say that he too is hiding some very good form. Well, he's wanted to come back to the Tour de France. He is back in the Tour de France. And now he's got the chance of his life here. He is the new time trial champion as well. So uh, for Russia, so Menchop underway. This man, Paul, over these last few years, he's either ripping the legs off everybody or he's a total disaster, isn't he? Well, there's uh, many riders have been enigmatic like that. Uh, Sylvain Chavanel has still got the fastest time at the finish line. He was equaled at 3.2 kilometers by his own teammate, Tony Martin. Then all of a sudden, disaster struck for the German world champion. Uh, nobody deserves luck like that at the most important day of the year for in the prologue time trial, the world champion off his bike for far too long. Here he comes now. He's not allowing any thoughts to creep into his mind. He's got to hold his concentration and drive up to that finishing line. And we'll see where he finishes. But he can't possibly get to the time of Sylvain Chavanel right now. That's a real shame for Tony Martin because he's fought his way back from his injury problems. He's got back, he's got form, and then he has a problem like that. The only good will he can take out of this is that he knows that the best time was reported by his own teammate, Sylvain Chavanel. They're on the same Omega Pharma quick step. If you look at the time here, Phil, take off 20 seconds. This would have annihilated the field. Well, the time goes by now. That's the difference between winning and losing the prologue for Tony Martin. He would have won. Well, I can't say he would have won yet, but he would have got the race lead. He has only fallen short by 250 metres, despite the stoppage. As he hits the line now, it is outside the top 35. When you think about Frank Schleck losing 30 seconds in this time trial, this man lost 15 seconds on Sylvain Chavanel, as well as changing his bike. Well, we return down to the start house now as we look at Jürgen Vandenbroek here now and uh, he is a Belgian that the Belgians are saying is going to make a podium in Paris this time around and I wouldn't argue with them because he can climb mountains very well. He was fifth overall in the recent Criterium du Dauphiné in the Dauphiné region of France uh, in the Alps and everybody knows that that's an indicator of Tour de France form. The next man to climb into the starting house, Phil, will be Bradley Wiggins of the United Kingdom. We'll be looking here at the man who won the Amgen Tour of California, Robert Hessink. Hessink also a man who is looking long term to Paris here. He can ride a time trial as he showed us in California. Uh, he won the California time trial stage there but much further than it is today. Here comes the grit and determination of Alexander Vinokurov as he heads up towards the line. Another respectable ride for a man who's passing out. Oh, he hits the line with a nice jerk. The 53rd place uh, down the pan. The man in black. Bradley Wiggins so far this season he has never put a wheel out of place he's now licking his lips he said bring it on I want to start this Tour de France well now he's about to do just that got tremendous support here just to the left where he is now there's a whole block of British supporters and they've got his nickname Wigo all the way down in individual letters Paul, he's got to give it his best shot. He can't afford not to. Could 11 starts behind him, uh, and it could be even by default. But he could be the leader by the end of the day with the best time. He wants to win the prologue if he can, because it's a psychological slap in the face to everybody else. He's got a very aggressive, a low-profile position there. He's come out, Phil. I don't think in recent years I've ever seen anybody come out perfectly in their preparation for the Tour de France. Third overall in the Tour of the Algarve in the early part of the season. He went on in March to win Paris-Nice. A month later, he was the winner of the Tour of Romandie. Two months after that, he was the winner of the Criterium de Dauphiné. But it's all been about building up for this month. That's all he's dedicated his season to. Last year, we left him on the roadside on the seventh day, nursing a broken collarbone. Jerome Coppel here, one of the rising stars from France, making his start. I wouldn't like to be chasing uh, Bradley Wiggins right now, but that's the look of the draw as he... Ryder Hazardal, without doubt the best Canadian and the Canadian of the year this year. Ryder won the Tour of Italy. That was the first ever by a Canadian cyclist and that was in May into June. And now he's here at the Tour de France. The last man to do the double, by the way, was Marco Pantani in 1998.
That was uh, when Pantani went on from winning the Tour of Italy on to win the Tour de France as well. Denny Menshov, as we've said, Will, I think is a bit of a sleeper in the Tour de France this year. He's not going to win the time trial this afternoon, but that's not a bad ride. That's not a bad ride, and uh, I can't say it's a better ride for Wiggins either, who's just gone through the check in 10th place, but six seconds slower than Sylvain Chavanel. So that is a little bit of a shock ride there. That's a bit of a shocker for this man, but he again is better suited to the long individual time trial. 10th place, looking for six seconds he's in that low profile position there but it's all about the latter part of the race here this afternoon i think it'd be a bit surprised when the time check comes through it's a short violent effort here's another man many people think could win the tour de france vincenzo nibali of liquid gas cannondale well he's twice finished third in the tour of italy he's once won the tour of spain but he's never been in the top six in the tour de france and maybe this year because he's dedicated his year uh, to a top podium finish in paris and it starts right now for vincenzo Vincenzo Nibali back up the road to Bradley Wiggins the first time check saying he's six seconds off the pace of Sylvain Chavanel as we go round the square again he's about a kilometre and a bit from the finish kilometre and a half from the line well if I was to say a course had been designed for a rider like Bradley Wiggins this is the course it's a sparse man's course rider Hazardal as well he has had to recover from riding the three-week Giro d'Italia which he won for Canada the first time that has ever happened and get himself ready for the tour I I think he might be a little bit short on top end speed in the first couple of days here because he's been away from competition since the Giro d'Italia but once we get into the first week of this uh, Tour, of, Tour de France we're going to see this man I think being competitive well in Coming up here faster than the Tran of Grand Vitesse down in the station. Wiggins hits the line now. He is in first place, 52.3 kilometers an hour. And look at that, Paul, by just about half a second quicker than Chavanel. He, he was six seconds faster than Chavanel over the second half of this course. He went out prudently, he went out carefully, not pushing himself, and he saved all of that acceleration for the last part of the course here this afternoon. So Wiggins now all of a sudden. 0.42 of a second is the fastest man. What, though, Phil, is Fabian Cancellara going to do to this course? Well, we're going to find out. Uh, here's the rather youthful face of uh, Thomas Wachler, who was fourth in the Tour de France last year, and uh, unlucky in the end not to podium, I guess, outwitted by the Sheck brothers and by Cadell Evans. But he is a character, this man, and he held the jersey for a long time last year as well and so he is underway and we're delighted to see him in the race the Frenchman uh, because he's had a knee problem he's got over it he was his start was in doubt is within a week of this event and he says my knees fine I'll be in Liège and he's underway well, that was the, re the Olympic champion he will go to London to defend that championship and he dreams of winning it again four times the world time trial champion four times he has won the first day the time trial in the Tour de France is it going to be five his whole career started right here in Liège in 2004 this man had a tough start to the season uh, he came out perfectly in the early part of the year winning the Strada Bianchi in Italy then the seventh stage of the Tiro Adriatico he thought he was going to be the winner of the Tour of Flanders then all of a sudden Lady Luck threw him to the ground and broke his collarbone into four places since then he's had to fight his way back up to the top of the sport he recently won the time trial championships of Switzerland Phil by a mere two minutes Cadell Evans, who last year became the first Australian to win the Tour de France, he returned home to a huge crowd in Federation Square. He couldn't believe it. He broke down when he arrived back home. The Aussies are back in force with a record entry in the Tour this year with 12 riders. But this is the man. And over these last few weeks, I think you we agree, he's ready. Enormous cheers for Fidel Evans, he's very, very popular. The last man of 198 goes out of the start ramp ball. Cadell Evans has said he thinks he's ready. He knows what Wiggins has done, and I would think he can match it. That is a big advantage, and look at the high cadence that he's pedalling at. We saw Tony Martin, the world champion of this discipline, a little earlier on using massive gears and a slow cadence. Cadell Evans has opted for a Lance Armstrong type cadence here. Around about 100 revolutions a minute, his legs are going around there, keeping his pace right up there to that 31 mile an hour average speed. He knows he needs to hold if he wants to rival Brad. Bradley Wiggins and possibly 
get himself in the top three or four of today's individual prologue time trial. He has put Ryder Hazardal has put in a fine performance here. He's not going to beat Bradley Wiggins on this occasion, but he's announcing himself, Phil, as a contender for the top position in the Tour de France this year. Well, he said, I can win a Tour de France. He didn't uh, make it clear which one. Well, he's in this one, so maybe we should start thinking now. 12th place for Ryder Hazardal. Perfect start, if you want my opinion, to his prologue here. And now tomorrow the road races start. Vincendo Nabali, he equally would like a place in the top 15 men by the finish. There are only six men left on this course now, Phil. Uh, Vincenzo Nibali, the, the sixth rider from the end behind him. Michele Scarponi, Sammy Sanchez, Thomas Vokler, Cancellara and Cadell Evans. But I wonder, we're all waiting with bated breath to see the time check. Uh, Nibali was eighth at the first time check there, uh, losing four seconds. That is probably the best time trial performance he's done all year. This is impressive as he comes into the finish line. He won't be too far off. Much better time trialling that he put in in the Amgen Tour of California early on in the season. This has been his aim all year. A ride in the Tour de France. He knows he can lose the Tour de France in the time trials. He has to stay low to the, low, uh, close to the top names as we go to the mountains in a week's time. And the body comes home. It is a great ride. 12th place at the moment for him. He probably slipped just a couple of places more before the finish. He'll be pleased with that. He will be behind Sylvain Chavanel. But in in fact, at that point, he was faster than Bradley Wiggins. Well, there's the huge crowd down on the quays on the banks of the River Meuse. As uh, we see, have looked down from the helicopter, nobody is rocking the boat at the moment on the arrival point at 3.2 kilometres on the Quai de la Goff. As uh, Cadell Evans has made the turn, he's soaring from the helicopter, accelerates away as he sees the whole flotilla of cars following the defending champion of the Tour de France. This man wants to do what he did in 2004. Fabian Cancellara is on a ride. Best time at halfway. 3 minutes 34 well that's incredible Fabian Cancellara has come in with the best time 3 minutes and 34 seconds at the check he has ripped the legs off Sylvain Chavanel but only by a second but he should be building on that as the riders continue now to come down it is all a matter of now this is Scarponi coming in as Michele Scarponi, who was given at the Tour of Italy on the disqualification of Alberto Contador last year, has had a good ride in the Tour of Italy again this time around. He finishes, but it's all about now whether Cancellara can beat the time of Bradley Wiggins and whether Evans can stay in contention. We look at uh, Cadell Evans now out on course, chasing Cancellara, knowing he's chasing the fastest man in the world. Oh, he is heading for the best time again in Liège. Paul, he can't lose, I don't think, you shouldn't say that, should you really? But as I say, his career started here in the age. We're watching the finish at the moment of Thomas Voigtley. He won't live with the speed of the big man we call Spartacus as Fabian Cancellara heads up. Uh, Tommy Voigtley here has done a reasonable ride for him. But he's just going to be inside the top 100 as he hits the line. But it's all about the arrival of Fabian Cancellara. Cancellara fastest at the first time check. But in fact, Phil, at the first time check, uh, Cadell Evans was one second faster than Bradley Wiggins but Wiggins took it off very quickly at the end. Look at the time. Well, look at that. Inside seven minutes as our cameras pick him up in the straight. It's going to be tight, but I think he'll get a shave it by maybe a second here. As he comes up towards the line, he knows what he's got to do. Cancellara, is it's going to be his fifth opening day in the Tour de France? It looks like it. Best time, 7.13.46. Fabian, fabulous Cancellara. Well, he smashed it. That was the biggest beating that anybody has shaved off the leaders. Look at his face. He looks, you just saw his eyes there, Phil, just looking up. <laughs> Seven seconds in a race as short as this is a crushing of the opposition. Well, Cancellara will, for the fifth time, walk off with a yellow jersey for tomorrow's opening day of the Tour de France on the roads. Cadell Evans, though, is pushing a great time here. He is quicker than Bradley Wiggins, who has just slipped into second place behind Cancellara. And if he finishes in the top three, then we know it, Paul. Cadell Evans is ready. He is ready. I think he was playing a little bit of a possum when he rode the Criterium de Dauphiné, but he raced. He kept pushing Bradley Wiggins every day. The time to beat is 7.13. I can't believe that he's going to do that. But what's he going to do vis-à-vis -vis his position relative to Bradley Wiggins? The and big two that names. That is all that matters. His time against the favourites. Cancellara will not be winning the Tour de France only today. But what a way to do that. As Evans rides up towards the finish now, the time of Wiggins has slipped by 
at 7.20. Evans has lost about 10 or 15 seconds here to Bradley Wiggins. Hits the line in 13th place, so he concedes uh, on the Bradley Wiggins there just about nine seconds. Yeah, but Phil, if you finish in the top 15 of the prologue of a race like the Tour de France, the indication is the form is there. You can't ride a good ride like this unless the engine is ready. But it just shows you, Paul, the pursuit champion of the Olympics set on two occasions over four kilometres, Bradley Wiggins over six, really turned the screw over that last half. He certainly did. He rode that last half probably faster than anybody else uh, in this race here this afternoon, which is an indication we will have some very exciting long individual time trials further down the road in the Tour wins for his second time in Liège Bradley Wiggins in second place announcing his favorite tag is definitely worthwhile TJ Van Garden hats off to the young TJ the man from Boulder has done the ride of his life there fourth place for him only 10 seconds off Cancellara and Eddie Boysenhagen there completing the top five Lancaster who led briefly is down into sixth place Gilbert eventually finishing in ninth and Andre Grivko the leader for such a long time at the start of the day he was the fourth man to begin don't forget he completes the top 10 Fabian Cancellara is the man who will pull on the first yellow jersey of the 99th Tour de France he has delivered what he did back in 2004 when we didn't really know him it was his first Tour de France and he won this stage in the age which was also a prologue now we've moved down the calendar a little bit but he scored this time again Bradley Wiggins over those last three kilometers was faster than anybody he just kept lifting it and lifting it and in the end he loses the time trial but only just One of the busiest ports in Belgium, the River Meurs, though, can go back to sleep shortly as the riders now say farewell to Liège and head to nearby Serain in Belgium. It's a ride of 123 miles the way they go in a clockwise loop of the famous Belgian Ardennes before we find the chateau in Serain and indeed this finishing line here. The cloud is about, but so far, fingers crossed, the rain has kept away. 3.55 is the latest time gap. Paul, this group got away literally on the drop of the flag today and they've never been seen since they haven't been seen since they built themselves an advantage of four minutes and 50 seconds at one stage but when you look at the front end of the main field phil the radio shack nissan have said they will defend this jersey right down to the at uh, the outside of uh, the alps if they can and that's why they've got all of their riders sitting on the front end of the main field and they've started to reduce that gap down to three minutes and 55 seconds they've pegged those six riders at the front so the best rider in that leading group uh, by the way is uh, michael morkov who a former uh, silver medalist in the uh, track championships in uh, Los Angeles, I believe. He's in 51st place. He's 24 seconds behind. Also a silver medalist in the pursuit, the team pursuit, that is, in the Beijing Olympic Games. But he's now turned his attention to the road. He is best placed, 24 seconds off the race lead after his ride in the time trial yesterday. And he is a first-timer in the Tour, along with uh, uh, Nicola Edet also in that breakaway that's where we are at the moment behind us the first two climbs Morkov got the first figure four there the second figure four was won by Urtizen and we're now heading for the third one and then of course after the feed the green sprint point so we will have our first leader in the King of the Mountains today this man knows all about that Jens Voigt once wore the leader's jersey in the King of the Mountains fell off when he wore it actually he hit a brick wall on the descent uh, Voigt is now heading up to 41 years of age yep uh, there's the world champion uh, just a little bit up to the front end of the main field and that of course was uh, Mark Cavendish uh, the question mark is will he sprint halfway through this course or is he just going to go for stage victories everybody knows this young man has been the most prolific winner of stages in the Tour de France over the last four years with 20 victories amounted in four years only I just feel as though he won't call but we'll find out he's a proud man when it comes to spin I think he's a little diversion in the Sky team this year uh, because their aim is a final yellow for Bradley Williams but the breakaway here Jean Ertazan Bouet Ede and Delaplace, Ede and the Morkov, there he is. Uh, they are the two first timers in the breakaway, and they haven't wasted any time in getting into the breakaway. No, that was the important thing. Everybody wanted to get onto the first breakaway of the Tour de France because just in case somebody makes a tactical error on the running towards the finish, 31 countries represented in the Tour de France this year, and in fact, for the first time ever, an Argentinian. He rides for Team Saxo Bank, JJ Hayedo. Oh, he's really an American, isn't he? Well, he speaks with an American accent. Well, he spent a lot of time in the States as well, but even so, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the, the tentacles of the Tour de France spreading quite literally around all continents of the world. 
happy days for the moment number four is Philippe Gilbert we know all about him he gave his uh, his baby a little ride round the start area this morning in Liège now it's down to business he's a good tip for the victory today it is a very difficult uh, approach the line over cobblestones it is a mile up the hill Paul it will have to be judged to absolute perfection if you go too early on the run up towards the finish line today you will fade and you will get passed by faster men you have to time it to perfection it's a very difficult start to the climb it starts off steeply but then it continues right the way up to the finishing line here it never really gets very easy I reckon that Philippe Gilbert has been and looked at this climb about 50 times over the last uh, six months Phil he lives 50 miles away from here so he will have studied this climb to perfection he'll know every which way he has to go to try and win he hasn't had a great season we know that he hasn't even opened up his bank account yet so far this year but you know I think he's put all of his problems behind him and when you finish in the top 10 of a prologue time trial at the Tour de France and your name's Philippe Gilbert you're racing in Belgium you've got to do well well we're looking at yes and there is Levi Leipheimer wearing 191 uh, made his name over these last few years by being the winner of the Amgen Tour of California this year though it was a comeback race for him after his broken leg and now he's showing the form that might see him on the podium in Paris four Sundays from today well his teammates seem to believe that he is a man uh, who will be the leader of this race and uh, he is a very good individual time trialist and the fact that we've got 63 miles of individual time trialing in the Tour de France this year is uh, making a lot of people think that maybe the time trialists will have a slightly better chance this season that little arm their movement there was from Yaroslav Popovic he's one of the men on Radio Shack Nissan they will do everything they can this afternoon to protect the overall lead of Fabian Cancellara because they honestly believe he will stay in contact on this final climb of the day and he could lead this race Phil for the whole week well uh, two minutes 48 is showing at the moment as we're now looking at the peloton they're in no rush but they are slightly oh. reducing and now there is a problem that's why he was moving to the back of the field he's going to change a wheel I think yeah but there's no panic there is no panic at all he had his hand up here it's not a flat it's a tire problem, I think they're just adjusting saddle. the brakes there the saddle or brakes yeah Archie's saddle it must uh, he's noted is probably half a millimeter too high well you know there's no panic on board here you know for the race is riding at a steady tempo he doesn't need to panic he just take take his time to get back into the main field he used the convoy of cars to slipstream his way to the back end of the peloton and then assume his position at the front end of the main field that uh, little repair cost uh, about 22 seconds well yesterday that was about what it took for Tony Martin in the prologue that was very significant but today I don't think there's any much uh, very much concern because this is the road race section of the Tour de France now and that Leipheimer will get through the convoy and back into the pack the pressure is not on at the moment as the breakaway is uh, still up the road but none of those men up the road are likely to win this year's Tour de France I think uh, I don't think they'll win the stage either but time will tell us the answer to that one no on the these are the six leaders and we, uh, we've got two tour first timers in the breakaway Nicola Ede of the Cofferdis team and uh, Mikhail Morkov also of uh, he's of the Saxo Bank squad uh, ex-track rider at a very elite level won a silver medalist in the uh, in the Olympic Games in 2008 now a concentrated roadman we're now moving towards that third fourth category climb which is the Côte de Lyonneau and that's to come now only under the new rules which started last year one point only the only the first rider on these climbs gets a single point towards the king of the mountains competition so the categorized climbs at uh, the fours are the lowest or the shallowest climbs you'll get in the Tour de France we go to outsized category which we call HC or category the green S there, that is the sprint point of the day. New rules again, which started last year. The only point along the course where the sprinters will try to snatch the maximum points. 20 for the first man, and there's no more till the finishing line. A rider like Mark Cavendish would be expected to go for those. We'll see. This is the peloton all together. A little glimpse there of the uh, Church of Saint André indicates that we are in the town of Lierneu, and that is the start of the climb of Lierneu with the six leaders. And again, Phil, well, I must have to say, with the little bit of picture breakup we get, we do have to explain that this is not a stadium, this is not a basketball <laughs> arena, oh. this is a rolling road. The pictures are being brought from cameras moving along all of the time throughout the whole of this two and a half thousand mile route. Oh, uh, 
Côte de Lyonneur. It's 2.1 kilometres, about 1.6 miles uh, up the climb today. It takes us up to just over uh, 1,600 feet above sea level. We're approaching the nearly the highest point in Belgium at 527 metres. The crowds are enormous. We expect that. This is Belgium sport. A little less so here in the French-speaking district of Belgium. It's a little bit more the Flemish-speaking area, but then there's proof how popular it is. Well, I'd just like to add there, Phil, a nice little anecdote. The highest point in Belgium is actually called the Barrack de Fréture, <laughs> a country which is known for its chips or its French fries. I have to say, I think that's rather appropriate. And funnily enough, when they go through the Barrack Fréture, that's where the feeding station is. I wonder if they'll get chips and mayonnaise today. <laughs> Yes, the uh, local language for chips or French fries is friture or fritz. So, uh, yeah, well, we'll see. And you'll, you probably won't believe me if I tell you this, but in fact, the Barak Friture in the winter is actually the Belgian ski resort. They have an average of 20 days skiing throughout the season. And I was talking to one of our Belgian technicians. He told me if you're really lucky, the downhill ski slope can take you a full 40 seconds. So we continue on the climb. The two climbers so far, Michael Morkoff won the first climb, Uruzan won the second, so they're equal first in the race for the first wearer of the polka dot jersey. We might see a different rider try to go here. There are five climbs on course today, including the winner of the stage, because that's also a fourth category climb. So none of these riders in the breakaway, as we look at the peloton, have won a stage of the Tour de France. None has ever worn a leader's jersey. But tonight, uh, that could all change for one of them at least. Little idea to show you what uh, 192 cyclists look like when they're all packed together. This is what we call the peloton. The big bunch of riders all together at the moment, riding it just on three minutes behind these six men. Yeah, these six men uh, opening up the roads of the Tour de France here this afternoon. That's Maxime Bouet in the front, but that's the man who's the most popular along the race route today, Philippe Gilbert. All of the signs and all of the cheers for Ooh. the for the Belgian Hello, World Race Champion. Up. <laughs> They're queuing up, Phil, basically, because they need to get around the corner and there's not enough room. That's absolutely right, and we've got a little move off the front. This is uh, Maxime Bouet who's decided as he can't sprint. He's hit them hard to try and get a point at the top and put him equal first in the King of the Mountains. It was uh, Anthony oh, Della Plaza who got yeah, across yeah. there, but in fact, the man who's taking up the pace, the chasing in the blue and yellow jersey, that is Michael Morkoff, and he's just trying to make sure he judges his catch just to perfection. There's only one point for the first rider to go over the top of this climb, but look at the orange rider there, that's Urtasun. He is also looking for the point. It's going to be a very well challenged sprint. It is, and Della Plaza uh, has gone clear, uh, but Morkoff is creeping up on him, and he's taking within Urtasun. The, t the first two winners, and I think he has gone a little bit too early here, Anthony Delaplace in his second Tour de France. Yeah, but look, look at Morkov there, Phil. I think he's in a good position. He's actually being able to come up to the back wheel of the French rider. He looks over his shoulder. He's waiting to see when the challenge is going to come. He's riding like the track rider that he is. He's waiting to hear the, si the whistle of the, the, the tyres with the acceleration once it starts. The sprint point is just up ahead there. Look at Morkov in the blue and yellow jersey. He's waiting and waiting to start his sprint. I think he's got this one in the back. He's gone to the front, that's the only downside. He's riding like a track cyclist he once was, an Olympic silver medalist and a world champion silver medalist on the track. He's standing there watching and waiting for the move from Urtazan. Well, he's staked his claim for the my, for the polka dot jersey. Now they've opened up here. And the, first of all, we've got the Kofidis rider in the red of Ede taking on Morkov. Well, we don't normally see this spinning for a single point in the King of the Mountain, but then the track man prevails and Morkov takes it on the line. Well, I'm not sure. I think Otasson, he thinks he got it there, or maybe he just came He's up a little bit too slowly. But, you know, Morkov, for me, Phil, this is Morkov in the blue and yellow here. He was in complete control of the situation. He was looking over his shoulder, waiting for somebody to make the move, and he controlled everything. So if he did get that single point there, he deserved it. He's got two now. In the old days, you would have got uh, three points for winning that, and second or third would have got two and one point. But now the rule prevails. Winner only on the shallow fourth category climbs. So that's the situation. The gap is just on three minutes as they go over the top of that climb.
the back of the peloton as they climb up here the Code de Libano just gone over the top Mikhail Morkov in a very close sprint with Ortizan the breakaway of six is clear they are sharing the points at the moment out in the Belgian Ardennes climbs uh, only one point for the top of the climb and if Morkov is confirmed as the winner of the climb then it means he will have two uh, to Ortizan's one well the one of those silver medals at the World Championships was in the Madison and to uh, get a medal in the Madison uh, which uh, hails its name from Madison Square Gardens when yep. they used to do six day racing there you have to be a very sharp sprinter hence the reason why they call that event the American because of where it started many many years ago there's also a prize of course small monetary prize for the first rider over the line a little flick of the arm they're trying to tempt through uh, Ertizon uh, but Ertizon's not having any of it so they've left Morkov on the front here knowing he's probably the fastest sprinter at the back here also a good sprinter is Johan Jean Jean he is uh, in the green jersey and he's going to have a go for it I think well you can see this is almost a can mouth there tactics he goes. yeah good call on that one Phil he's made the first move but watch for the reaction coming from Morkov but look at the man coming out Ooh. here because Ede has jumped out of the pack well I've never seen Ede race before this is his first Tour de France he may have gone just a little bit early Jean is trying but Ertizan is showing he can sprint he's beaten though by Johan Jean so you're a car get the 20 points and the crowd enjoying uh, a preview uh, of the sprint which will come down the road at Sarang although I doubt it'll be amongst these six riders I have to say my man uh, my tip there Michael Morkov <laughs> did very well he got six out of six well he's clearly decided to concentrate on uh, taking the early lead in the King of the Mountains I can't blame him for that a polka dot jersey awaits the leader tonight uh, there was no mountains in yesterday's flat stage the prologue time trial so it looks as though we've got around 350 the gap at the moment to the peloton and this is what is interesting now and we're asking the question is Mark Cavani's going to put in a sprint uh, because he is the defender of the green jersey won for the first time by a British rider in the Tour de France last year. Well Phil, Phil we've said this all year this is a complicated year for any of the top riders in professional cycling because you've got the Tour de France yes the biggest event that everybody wants to ride well in but when you've got the Olympic Games in the same year as uh, as uh, the Tour de France and you're from Great Britain it makes it a much more complicated call and I think Mark Cavendish being the only British track rider from uh, the Olympic Games in uh, Beijing not to get a medal he really dearly wants to get a medal this year in London well let's have a look change of teams at the front the Lotto Bellasod team have come to the front which means that Andre Greipel the big sprinter is interested the world champion Mark Cavendish in the white jersey center off to the right just bobbing in out there he is just tucked into the right well well, there's your answer Paul he's gonna have a go well they're all up there but there's still a lot of control going there from the riders from Lotto they'll be looking after Andre Greipel he's sitting in the middle there waiting for the moment to move Mark Renshaw is not too far off there because Matty Goss is the man who's gonna try and come up there from Orica Green Edge little bit of a banging of shoulders there too as uh, Matty, Matty Goss tries to get through but uh, in the fourth wheel there watch out because I think that uh, Mark Cavendish is interested possibly in testing his sprints finish here well that's uh, Andre Greipel in the uh, black and white jersey at the front there but still sitting still a long way to go that's Matty Goss in the uh, green and white jersey in about fourth position there right behind him Mark Marinshaw in the orange jersey then Cavendish with the yellow helmet well he might have a little go uh, Boyce and Hagen's behind Cavendish Cavendish is moving up slightly he always times his effort very late that's when he's got the advantage this incredible fast kick as he comes in sight of the line Greipel is the man they set it up for as he goes for the line now but here comes Cavendish is this a rehearsal for the finish today as Mark Cavendish goes and on the line his arch rival Greipel gets it and Cavendish has to play second fiddle remember that uh, uh, Mac Goss may have got it on the line there, not Greipel. Mac Goss, the Olympic Green Edge. Well, that is a reversal of the Olympic uh, pre road race rehearsal last year when it was Cavendish who beat Goss. Well, Goss that's that's Greipel on the left hand side of the road there, trying to fight his way up, but it's Matty Goss on the right hand side who eases up and looks back at uh, Mark Cavendish mm. there. The Australian gets uh, the first little victory there. Mark Renshaw also up there in third place. The Brick Sprinters all coming to the fore. Well, Mark Cavendish looking first to his right to see who beat him and then to his left to see where Greipel was. Uh, sandwich between his two arch rivals in the sprint, possibly for the Olympic road race. And his two ex-teammates. And his two ex-teammates, because the disbandment last year of Team HTC High Road, everybody spread out onto the new teams around the world. Greipel had been there a bit earlier than Goss. 
Well, there's an indication Mark Cavendish is taking a first serious interest in the points classification, so we'll see a little bit later on whether or not he can drag his body up this two and a half kilometer climb down towards the finish. In fact, uh, Phil, because of that acceleration in the main field, look what it's done to the time gap, because now all of a sudden the six-man leading group from four minutes lead have come down to 2.38. And the first time that uh, Mark Cavendish has been to the front of the peloton, albeit briefly there, as he came over the line. Well, if, by the way, uh, this uh, Ertesan wins this, that means we'll have two leaders on two points. Uh, and I don't think they'll be in contention for the last climb of the day because it's the finish and the peloton should be here. Then he goes on count back as to who wins. They'll have won two each. Then he goes to the overall situation, which would swing it possibly uh, to the day. Now we're off. And it's Ertesan who's got a good jump on the day in here as they both disappeared out of sight. Our camera's not allowed to pass the other riders. Uh, so tune in tomorrow. We'll tell you who won the race because they've gone right around the corner into the distance. I'm hoping that somebody will tell us who won. Well, the way he was positioned there, I have to have a guess that it was uh, Michael Morkov. He was right on the shoulder of Utterson all the time. They've gone uh, hollowing, hollowing up the road there. So <laughs> we'll have to wait for the official race referees. Nothing, we, could, nothing we could do about that because the cameras are not allowed uh, to pass the rest of the breakaway in a sprint finish like that. But the man in the far distance is Morkov. He is the track rider and the sprinter. And Utterson, I think, will have gone too soon. But we'll have to wait uh, for the announcement on race radio as to who got that. It looks to me like it's Morkov. Yeah, I think it will be Morkov. Uh, he was in an ideal position. He's got the sprint uh, much better than I think. Than, uh, oh, he knows he's got it. Well, there's confirmation there, Phil. He oh, knows yeah. he's got it. That's amazing. And, and he knows he's going to have uh, a leader's jersey at the end of the day. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice gesture, too, from Ertesan. Ertesan himself is riding his second Tour de France. This man's in his first. And on his first road race day, he has got himself a leader's jersey on the podium tonight. He, uh, he was trained by Heiko Salzwedel, a former East German, uh, who now trains the Russian, but he trained the Danish team to that silver medal in Beijing, of which uh, Morkov was part of in 2008. There's confirmation. Three points, Paul, he got now. He can't be beaten on the day. He's polka dot tomorrow. Yep, and now... This is Morkov, who has a, a polka dot jersey waiting for him at the finishing line tonight as uh, a Danish leader of the King of the Mountains memory serves me right I can only remember Kim Anderson wearing the polka dot jersey but I'm sure oh no and Bjorn Reese, of course who went on to win the tour in 1996 oh, oh there's, there's been a crash on the road here 67 seconds the gap and it's a Rabobank round uh, down on the right this is at the back of the peloton so in a quick look there's a number of riders gone down there as well from uh, Movistar uh, there was a sky rider there who has also gone down who has got up and started to ride away there's a movie, st movie star uh, rider down there as well, and that is Vladimir Karpitz. Well, we're looking at the remnants of a crash which has just happened here. Sky Rider was definitely involved. He's now kicking back in. It's not Wiggins, and it is not Boyson Hagen who has gone clear, and it looks okay. Uh, just a little bit of a shunt at the back. It has left one rider from Rabobank down at the moment. We'll catch up on him uh, when we can. This is Michael Rogers, the Aussie rider. Uh, that's a little bit more serious to catch Michael off the back because he's got a hard chase now. Well, he's pretty, pretty much got ripped up as well. You can see his radio is uh, popping out of his jersey there, and he went down very hard indeed. And Michael Rogers has got great form. He just recently finished second in the Criterium de Dauphiné. But because of that crash, you know when a crash happens, Phil, you can hear the scream and the screech mm. of metal behind you. It makes every Everybody very very nervous indeed and you can see that by the way that everyone's accelerating left and right in this peloton to get to the front because they know that's the safest place to be yes and this is now the most had as oh dear me and the Uskadel Uskadi ride just about squeezed in there as they came into the peloton at the back as the spectators seeing the peloton being kept to one side of the highway it must mean there's a turn coming up I would think these are the six leaders and still clear of the field and uh, safely away from those shunts. Not too sure who the Rabobank rider was who crashed. Uh, Rogers certainly did. And they're saying that it was Samuel Sanchez, uh, Luis Leon Sanchez, Paul, who was involved in that fall. Well, there you can see, uh, there is the relationship. Uh, you can see all the cars queuing up behind that leading group of six riders. There's another crash gone down now, oh Phil. My Everyone's getting very nervous because we're getting that little bit closer to the finish. These crashes happen because it's the first 
mistake guys are taking risks they're trying to get up to the front then all of a sudden boom you go down and that's fairly much halfway down the main field that crash uh, it's not even it's almost at the front of the touch of wheels here as they go down right there but yes yeah, about a third down the field a massive stoppage fortunately it was reasonably slow motion even though we are showing it in slow motion as well and uh, they're just pulling the bikes out of the pack here but again it's riders falling and uh, you've got to be very very careful now as Maxi Montfort from Radio Shack who went down there on the right hand side he's just standing calmly at the side of the road he knows that pretty much his stage is finished here this side but look at this look at the pace well, now the nervousness of all of these riders battling to stay at the front and out of danger now this is like a Belgian cycle race now because when you race in Belgium because of narrow roads the approaches to finishing climbs the strong men get to the front and they ride and if you can't break in you tend to fall off uh, this is when we've gone back here this is the luckless Luis Leon Sanchez for the second year the national time trial champion of Spain he's been left in a wake today we saw him win before it looks like there might be that cameraman you know was a little bit too close here because they all started dodging wheels he should not have been there well what it was the majority of the guys at the front end of the main field they were able to get around him but that causes a rippling effect through the main field and that was definitely the origin of that crash but look at the speed here these guys are going absolutely ballistic right now on the left hand side you've got the black and blue jerseys of sky bradley wiggins in the green jerseys in a great position up at the front trying to keep himself out of danger i can't quite spot the yellow jersey of fabian cancellara at the moment but i wouldn't expect him to be too far away from the front well the, what is happening now is they are so nervous about the last climb up to the finish they've got to establish their place at the front of the peloton before the climb begins they're 11 miles from that climb but they've got the girl going faster and faster to try and hold front position this is a very dangerous moment in the stage well I had noticed Peter Sagan and his teammates had managed to avoid most of that he's in about to 15th to 20th position the lime green jerseys liquid gas Cannondale they are looking after the Slovakian champion who many people believe has got the power and the acceleration to get out of the gap there's the official 20 kilometer to go for sign that's 12 miles of racing but these guys now Phil have got less than 30 seconds advantage and still they continue they are 20 kilometers from the finish they have been in the lead for 178 kilometers they are still 30 seconds to the good well now a little bit of calm now you can see all the red and white jerseys in the middle that is team katusha it's a russian team but they're looking after a spanish rider this afternoon oscar Ferreira, a man who has had an enigmatic career but he's a prolific winner he's been three times the champion of the world in the professional road race and today i think it's also his type of finish these riders now will be gripping these handlebars till they've got white knuckles at the front now as they try to keep themselves out of trouble they stay extremely vigilant on these very narrow roads now they're trying to at the same time position the men on their team that they feel can win at the end of the day there's a lot of movement in this big pack right now there certainly is an awful lot of movement uh, David Moncoutier was the rider at the back with number 88 you'll see him ride at the back a lot during the stages of the Tour de France but one day he will have written on his book I want to go out on the attack and he will look for that I'm surprised to see him riding the Tour de France because uh, very often he said he'd rather participate in the Tour of Spain where he's won the King of the Mountains competition on four separate occasions well uh, we're hearing from radio tour that uh, thomas uh, vaucler was also delayed in that crash but he's okay uh, rogers is still off the back sanchez is still chasing rojas of alessandro valverde's movistar team also was involved in the first crash we saw uh, but now the cameras are all focused on the front here as the teams run george hincapie on the front on the far right with bmc on his sleeves as our vocalist team has got themselves organized the, the green boys on the right all the teams trying to get the men position now radio shack have relinquished the front now they can't control it anymore this is what i was talking about before when you get a crosswind you very easily get tailed off the back in this formation which is called an echelon because you can't get any more shelter from the wind from the riders in front of you this brace is really on We are looking across the fields here at a splintered peloton caused by two falls all of a sudden. And the peloton at the front riding as fast as they can now to stop everybody rejoining as they race towards Serain and the village uphill and the finishing line uphill. We are 10 miles from the start of the climb or 16 kilometers. 
Anyway, you can see now as we come to the racing part of the course here, we're in the racing time, but nobody's going to sit up and wait for anybody who's got fallen off the back for the moment. This is too important for these guys now. As you can see, Team Sky have got complete control at the front end of the pack. A huge field gradually coming together as these riders who are caught out are trying desperately to regroup here. You can see by the trees on the right, this wind is blowing now, and every time they change direction, it hits them from a different direction, and this makes it very difficult. Marcus Berghardt of BMC is now driving on the front. Well, not far away from the front oh. is Cadell Evans. Whoops, watch a little bump in the road there, Marcus Berghardt, because if you go down in first position, you'll take out about 30 men. Cadell Evans, and watch this, is it? There was a bottle, in fact, and oh, he just manages me. to correct it. You've got to be on the ball when you're a professional cyclist and you see something like that in the road. He looks back to make sure Cadell Cadell Evans is okay. Evans is in the top 10. I can see his red and black jersey there. He's being looked after by George Hincapie. The green jersey of uh, Bradley Wiggins is never very far away. But where is the yellow jersey of Fabian Cancellara? I haven't seen him for a while. No, Cancellara now will be watching just about everybody who moves at the moment. Well, well done Marcus Burkhart there because he took that uh, missile off the road and probably saved somebody falling deeper in the peloton. This is down to 15 seconds again it's 10.9 kilometers that's 30 that's uh, six seven miles of racing left to go i'm just thinking paul we're watching a sprint of some 10 mile 10 kilometers long six miles long it's because they have to ride so fast to stop the peloton getting on terms you've got to watch out the yellow jersey now fabian cancellara is far right of the picture he's about fourth or fifth in the line he's got himself back into position exactly where he needs to be just now he's a right he's a fighter he's a racer he wants that yellow jersey he wants to keep himself in contact and he knows that there's a couple of nasty little roundabouts like this on the running towards the finish so that's why all of a sudden he scuttled up the outside but look how long that line is in the main field if you're at the back you've got an horrible elastic effect you're yo-yoing off the back you're going from 20 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour and slowing down again it is an awful place to be it's much smoother the tempo in the first 30 positions we are looking for the 10 kilometers to go banner now those six riders have been in the lead for 188 of the 198 kilometers and we have an attack as we go under 10 kilometers to go it is Nicola Ede of Coffin is trying to lead this breakaway to the line don't look over your shoulder because they are right there and it is the team of Orica Green Edge who are chasing them down well they're trying to set this up they obviously believe in Matthew Goss here this afternoon that's why you've got guys like Stuart O'Grady making this organization we've got the racer computer Phil telling us the gap now is down to zero seconds well I think I'd agree with that on this occasion now, there's a little gap give them one second at the moment but there they are and there is the peloton what a breakaway this has been 189 kilometers in front as Maxime Bouet says you're not catching me not after all this effort I'm gonna go again well I'm not sure that was a very clever move because he's just prolonging the agony he will get caught before the end now because when you see the organization in a bunch like this you know it's all over bar the shouting he's just trying to keep his face on television a little bit longer for his family and his family actually uh, his uh, family in law actually hail from Marseille in the southern part of France and I'm sure as cycling enthusiasts they'll be all over this on a Sunday afternoon well, he's a long way from home just now as he keeps up the resistance to take it through nine kilometers to go the uh, uh, Lotto Bellasol team are the team which is closing it all down and they are driving they have a sprinter here in on Andre Greipel. I'm not sure that Andre can get up this hill though. Well, we'll have to find out. We will see at the end of the day in the second row there. You've still got Orica Green Edge nice and organized. Stuart O'Grady, the second rider in that uh, jersey. The jerseys are very, very complicated. These are the riders from that breakaway early on. They're getting spat out of the back with absolutely no mercy at all. Nice place to watch the race there on the right hand side if you've got a little bit of a jet ski. Eight kilometers to go, and the race is all together. 190 kilometers that breakaway survived eight short of the finishing line five miles well, looking over their shoulders the reason they're doing that is they want to make sure that their teammates and their team leaders are well protected I can still see the yellow jersey of Fabian Cancellara at four kilometers to go in an ideal position he's probably in about 21st place 
four kilometers to go 1.6 kilometers to the start of the finishing climb the red bands on the white jersey down there that is Edvard Bolsenhagen the finish suits him he has said maybe for me today the lotto team feel it for them Stuart O'Grady the first rider in the line who is not part of the team at the front about fifth man down is in a very very strong position here as well red and white jersey in about eighth ninth position there that's Oscar Freire he's not got any teammates around him, but he's a wily character he knows where to put himself this is a very hard fast run into the finish and once we get to there's a little move there that's Cadell Evans with again George Hincapi moving up right around the outside he's up to the wheel of Fabian Cancellara he wants to stay at the front end of the pack here this afternoon now just look at the way uh, Cadell Evans is being steered right to the front here with a great show of strength as Cadell moves up there and Sargon has spotted Cadell Evans go through and has jumped onto his slipstream so thank you very much I'll have a free ride to the front end of the pack here this afternoon but still Lotto Belisol in control at the front end of the peloton Stuart O'Grady looking into our camera lens there thinking about Matthew Goss here this afternoon we are up to the final climb of the day the Côte de Serin 2.4 kilometers it starts to get very very grippy here the bottom part of the climb is the steepest part but it goes all the way up to the finish line well Cadell Evans has spotted that Bradley Wiggins is interested in the win today he can't afford to lose any time to him on a finishing climb like this he's moving up to the front Peter Sagan he's looking for the victory at the moment and they are all repositioning and Edward Boysenhagen also there we're not talking about any real sprinters here apart from Sagan it looks like it's going to be a different type of finish the man on the front is Stuart O'Grady 16th participation in the Tour de France job done swinging off he leaves it up to the rest of the boys here this afternoon this is Albacini now the Swiss rider on Orica Green Edge they're trying to sort it all out in third position in that line is Matthew Goss behind him another Australian in the red and black jersey it's Cadell Evans is he going to look for the win well this is the climb now we have started it's all uphill to the finish now and he who gets it right wins the day the white jersey below us there two white jerseys one is Peter Sagan the champion of Czechoslovakia of, uh, of Slovakia followed by Edward Boysenhagen the new champion of Norway and still now every and Cadell Evans has got himself into third place well he's sitting there nice and comfortable the cobblestones at the bottom very very difficult you lose your impetus you lose all kinds of momentum now as Cadell Evans takes over there's Mark Cavendish attack. is not going to win there's an attack and that's Omega quick step who's launching it looks like Chavanel Sylvain Chavanel third yesterday in the prologue that was his best ever prologue in a Tour de France is now stomping away a Frenchman on a Belgian team trying to spoil it for the Belgians today the legs are locking up I think Paul it's a long long way to the summit it's nice to be able to try and do it but it's an awful long way to go up to the finish line even Peter Sagan here is uh, struggling to get across the gap looking over his shoulder he's dropping, back, he's dropping back they're stretching it out though because Chavanel will not give up there's an Orica green edge rider there it's not to Michael Albacini but I'm not too sure who it is he's come up onto the back wheel here as he comes up onto the back wheel we're now seeing though closing in Jürgen van der Broek is getting up there as well for Lotto Cancellara is holding position Wiggins in the green is on the left he's just taken the back wheel of Peter Sagan Evans is in front of them both well they're all battling to stay in contact with the front end of the main field here this afternoon but Cancellara has got the form because he's making a nasty little move here but he's covered by Peter Sagan well I can tell you privileged information but the team manager Dirk de Mol of Fabian Cancellara has just told him in his ear that it's no one stronger than you and he's made him attack well we're coming to the flatter part of the climb now at 1.3 kilometers to go you know what Phil it cast my mind back to Compiègne when he did exactly the same thing indeed Had the yellow jersey on his shoulders and said right I'm off mate I'm out of this pack there are not many men in the world could do this but Fabian Cancellara could the flick of the wrist says to Peter to Sagan come on mate give us a hand Edward Bosenhagen is coming across there as well he's looking to try and get himself a little bit of a stretch of an advantage in the best young best young riders competition huge effort but in Compiègne of course that was a flat finish this is uphill and it's still got a kilometer to go of climbing this is a huge effort by the yellow jersey to steal seconds he wants uh, Sagan to come on through and do some work Sagan won't come through and the hesitation will let Bosenhagen onto the back of the two of them that's both Rosenhagen with the yellow helmet scrambling across this gap desperate moments but they're opening up the gap Fabian Cancellara has got that engine in his bike again last like he had a couple of years ago when they accused him of having a motor on his machine so leaving it all now up to Cadell Evans to descend defend on the front in the red and black
Cadell Evans and on his back wheel is the Belgian who made a move and it failed. Jurgen van den Broek, the field on massing at the back. Now Cancelor assessing. He's in a situation here now because Peter Sagan doesn't want to go round him. He wants to win the stage on his first Tour de France. And Cancelor says, well, I'm racing the time. He goes again. And Boitenhagen is the man in the perfect seat. Well, I don't know, Fabian Cancellara knows it's all about time for him. If he can get another five or ten seconds here this afternoon, he can hold this yellow jersey all the way down to the mountain. He'd like to win the stage if he could, but he's got two very, very fast sprinters on his wheel. He now has to race for time only, not even think about the stage victory. Well, they can't hesitate much longer. Boysenhagen is under stress here. He's just about holding on. But the sprint is open by Fabian Cancellara as the attack comes from behind with Gilbert. And now it is Sagan going for the victory. Can Boysenhagen answer it? This is the first Tour de France for Peter Sagan. And Sagan is coming clear to get his first stage win at the first attempt. That is unbelievable. And win number 14 of the season for him. But having said, Sagan is the winner the man who scored most is Cancellara. Cancellara is a man when it comes to a move like that that was a very very courageous move that he made a strong move and you know if those guys had participated with him in a little bit of the pacemaking they might have opened up a huge gap and I have a funny feeling Phil that Philippe Gilbert sneaked in for a fourth or fifth place finish there yeah we think he was fourth our cameras went with the winner of course but that was Gilbert came away from the peloton beaten by a long attack there by um, a possessed Fabian Cancellara. All these riders now on this one climb will get separate times for the day. They will lose seconds on the race lead. Uh, so when we see the overall standings, we're going to see that uh, Cancellara has slightly increased his overall lead in the Tour de France with a terrific show of strength. He was racing the time, Paul. He was committed. He had to keep going for it, even though he knew he couldn't win it. Well, if you want a bit of panache, he's thrown some panache on the yellow yeah. jersey here this afternoon because he is a racer and he raced all the way up to the line there. Yes, he wanted to win with the yellow jersey on his shoulders, but when you've got Peter Sagan and Edvard Bosenhagen on your back wheel, it's a very difficult situation to find yourself in. But he kept going and he's opened up a little bit more of a gap at the top end of the leaderboard. Well, there it is for you, Peter Sagan. He's 22 and a half years of age, the champion of Slovakia, gets his 14th win of the season, but his first in his very first Tour de France. Phil, we watched this young man in the Amgen Tour of California dominate stages one, two, three, four, and then the final stage around LA Live, but that was a phenomenal victory for him. 22 years of age, I can't believe it, and the gaps at this top of this climb are unbelievable. A second per few metres, by the look of it because that's two minutes down they were all together at the same if that was Peter Velitz and I think it was crossing the line that's a serious time loss for him there of two minutes over the line yes liquid gas the boys in the uh, blue and the lime green colors liquid gas Cannondale team here uh, just seeing the result on the placard saying yes we got the win that's all that matters well they expected it to I tell you what uh, that was a phenomenal move just look at the acceleration of this guy here he really has got a real kick when it comes to the finish looks over his shoulder there for a little bit of confirmation gets himself the victory ahead of Cancellara he needs to go to Cancellara very quickly after the finish line Phil and say to him thank you very much mate because you've given me my first stage victory at the tour well is a very difficult man to beat as you said Phil 14 wins so far this season and they don't look like ending do they well a well-earned drink there for Peter Sagan in his first Tour de France he everything he's done this year he said I'm training for the Tour de France and now he's come and he's won a very difficult sprint the little advantage he has over the other sprinters is he can win almost any which way uphill and down there there's the results for you uh, given the same time for Cancelara, Boysenhag and Gilbert they caught them right on the line Bauk Mollema was the Rabobank rider coming in just behind uh, Philippe Gilbert uh, because they literally caught those three riders on the line they've all been given the same time uh, so won't be such big games uh, indeed for Cancelar. Valverde was sixth terrific start for the Irishman from Garmin Sharp Dan Martin also in his first Tour de France and the Canadian rider Hegedal was there in ninth place Jürgen Vandenbroek his team worked for him today in the end top ten for him 
Uh, Wiggins, uh, 16th. Cadell Evans, 20th. All given the same time. Uh, so we'll call that one a draw today for those two riders. As they, and there is Luis Leon Sanchez, who was involved in the crash, uh, just coming in now. I'm just looking around for the clock. It looks about four and a half minutes on the clock. Uh, lost by Luis Leon Sanchez because of that fall out on course. There he is, uh, Fabian Cancellara, Spartacus. He's had a great battle in the Coliseum today, but he's come out on top and he keeps his yellow jersey. Hey, the Tour de France leaves just north of Liège, where this race started three days ago from Vise. As we head now towards Tournai in Belgium, we trace the French borders now, and tomorrow we will cross them as we race on into France. That's where we're commentating from. The Tour de France is a sprinter's delight today. Just a little matter, they've got to pick up three riders out in front first. Well, Paul, we expect to see Radio Shack protecting the rights for Fabian Cancellara, looking for a week in the leader's yellow jersey. That breakaway, though, took a while to get away today. Took an awful long time, around about 22 kilometres or 13 miles of racing before the three-man breakaway established itself. Once it got to eight minutes, all of a sudden, alarm bells rang, and we've seen a lot of the teams of the sprinters criticised yesterday by Fabian Cancellara by not coming up to the front and sharing some of the pacemaking, actually doing the pacemaking. Team Lotto thinking about Andre Greipel, Team Orica Greenedge thinking, of course, about Matty Goss. Well, as they ride along here, they'll just keep the tempo steady. The gap has been up and down. It's been out to eight minutes at 31 miles into the race. It's come back a little bit now to just under six and a half minutes. There's been no dramas, but you may have seen yesterday when Tony Martin crashed very early on. Well, he's riding with a plaster over a broken scaffold today, but he wants to continue the Tour de France. It is a sprinter's delight. It's basically flat. We're not very much above sea level all day. We we do have the fourth category climb, which is the Citadel in the city of Namur in Belgium, which, uh, interestingly, Paul, very first foreign city I ever visited on my bike back in 1961. A beautiful, it is a beautiful citadel. Well, the yellow part on the left-hand side is the part of the course that we have covered. The blue part is what is left to go, and that's 133 kilometres at the moment, which is around about 85 miles. These are the three leaders, and it was started by Anthony Rue, who got away 13 miles in, then a long chase. Morkoff here, Michael Morkoff, the Dane, he got across, and he wears the polka dot jersey. It's his first Tour de France, he's 27 years of age, um, but he's uh, now chatting with his teammate here. <laughs> the team manager, rather. <laughs> I don't think I can't hear anything maybe you could at home but anyway his, uh, his ambition is uh, to try and retain his lead for another day in the King of the Mountains so expect to see him in action very shortly at the Citadel anymore well let me do the translation there Phil because obviously it was in Danish and it came across uh, quite easily now I've, in fact she managed to probably telling him look you know you're six and a half minutes clear just around the corner is the uh, Citadel de Mure, the big climb of the day you've got the most points in the race so far just make sure that you get the points over the top of this climb and you can keep that jersey for a few more days to come although tomorrow there are five climbs in the last 18 miles of the race there are and uh, i'd add on to that sentence paul and after you win your point drop back to the pack because you're wasting your time staying up front today uh, that would be the common sense thing to do because uh, as scott moninger has said uh, in fact uh, it's only his first Tour de France. He was in the lead for 188 kilometres yesterday, uh, which is nearly 120 miles. If he's thinking of doing that again today, he isn't going to finish the Tour. That's a very good point, Phil. You have to be very, very careful. This is a flat tie here. This is a replay looking back, and uh, this is what happens. If you don't panic, you get a very quick wheel change. Uh, just having a look here, this looks like uh, number 43, and that, of course, should be Danilo Hondo, who is a former German national champion and the lead-out man for Alessandro Pataki. He'll wait for the team car to come up belong, 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 behind him and then he should be able to change that wheel uh, in around about 15 to 20 seconds which he did he's back in the field now but uh, Alessandro Bataki who he's hoping to lead out today has said he's up for the race today to the finishing line he wants to win a stage so uh, don't they all the sprinters so we're going to see a terrific finish today there's no doubt about that when we get down to the finish here in Tournai just to finish your thought 
there, Phil. Uh, you're very right about the Tour de France. Uh, I was once told by a, a former British professional cyclist, uh, Barry Hoban, who was a very good sprinter, won eight stages of the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. When you make an effort in the Tour de France, it has to be for a reason. It has to be to win something. And that is why Michael Morkov needs to be very careful how he uses that energy, because you've got a bank account of energy. And if you use too much, you don't get into the last week of the Tour. That's right. You can't leave a deposit in a bank account when it's a matter of energy, can you? And get it back later. That's the trouble. Well, we're going to follow the uh, Esco River today, a lot today, as we course our way down towards the finish. We're going in a generally due westerly direction all of the way away from Liège, as I say, we're into Namur now. The citadel, which sits here right in the middle of Namur, is often the scene of famous bike races. It is a nasty little climb in the centre of town. Yeah, we a uh, little caption at the bottom there, by the way. The polka dot jersey is uh, put up there because he's with the leading group of riders. Look at the uh, stick of the jerseys at the bottom. Shows you the green jersey, the white jersey, and the yellow jersey are all in the main field. They're at 6 minutes and 22 seconds behind. For the moment, I don't feel that that's really important. It's what's going to happen when we come down to the fast finish because the sprinters, the gladiators of the route, want to have their day. Oh, into Namur, we're looking for the citadel, it is a climb of uh, 2 kilometers, about 1.2 miles and uh, there's only one point for the King of the Mountains competition and the man who's made the effort to be in the break to get that point is the leader of the competition, on the right number 175, Michael Morkoff. And I tell you what, uh, he's got the most points in the race so far, only three points, amazing to think that that's all he's got, he's got uh, Peter Sagan with one point and it looks to me as if uh, the rider in the front here, Anthony Rue, has got a little bit of a problem because he's holding his hand off the handlebars this is a scene by the way if you are a film buff of a very interesting film called the Velo de Gislain Lambert it's about a Belgian cyclist who actually started off as a, a guy working in a factory and dreamed about becoming a professional cyclist and he raced up this climb it's a good film if you get a chance to watch it but the French is rather difficult well this is the infamous climb it is on cobblestones occasionally as you can see many famous bike races uh, finish up here uh, clearly at the moment we've there is something wrong here I don't know whether he fell off and Anthony Rubri is not happy at all here. Well, you can see he's actually got uh, a bandage on his uh, left hand there. The two fingers are actually bandaged together, so it's obviously getting it's getting rattled because of the cobblestone and the rough nature of this climb here. The citadel at the top, by the way, Phil, goes down uh, to around about 2,000 years of age. Mm. We can see here Cavendish uh, getting back onto the tail of the peloton, having a quick chat with his teammate. Now, we've got to be careful now because that is Bernie <laughs> Isel, but he was wearing number 104, but we had a bit of fun on the first day because they all had the wrong numbers on. They did. They put the wrong numbers on and... Uh, They've sorted it out now. This is the Citadel itself here. These are the riders. It's interesting that Rue is continuing. The reason he doesn't want his hand on that handlebar is because of the rattling it's getting off the cobblestones and then obviously it's very painful and it must be from an earlier crash here. He's the most experienced as far as being a pro in the breakaway goes. He's 25, fifth year to pro. It's his third Tour de France and uh, last year he was second in the French Road Race Championships. He's a complex rider. Yeah, before we get to the sprint point, I just have to tell you that this fought the citadel at the top here was 45 in, 45 in 908. It's been besieged by many of the leading figures of Europe between the 15th and the 19th century. It's been the headquarters for a Dutch garrison. It's been the barracks for the Belgian army. But later on in 1891, it was uh, transformed into a massive natural park. But that's not what Michael Morkov's thinking about. He's thinking about the line at the top because uh, another one point in the bag for him. And I don't think any of these riders will actually challenge him because he is a man who comes from a great track background. A silver medal in Beijing in the, uh, in the team pursuit. Uh, a world championship a couple of years ago in the team pursuit and the Madison. He is a top track rider and he will know exactly how he wants to sprint this one out. Even if it's only for a single point, that could be important for him and his team. Well, the two Frenchmen I don't think is going to spoil the Danish party here, surely. There's only the winner counts, it's one point. Uh, it's not going to give him the King of the Mountains title over three weeks, but it's going to keep him in Polka Dot as they come up towards the summit. I think they will allow the Danish rider to take this. The other rider in the breakaway, by the way, Christoph Kern in the green jersey there. Well, just two hours before he went on stage in Liège for the team prize presentation last uh, Thursday, his wife gave birth to their first son, Tom, and so uh, he's in the breakaway, and he's rather hoping this breakaway does succeed. Well, in fact, Phil, he was given permission to be away from the presentation because he was actually at the birth, which was on the day of the presentation, and he uh, flew straight up to the start of the Tour de France after that. I can confirm that Rue was involved in an accident yesterday, and that's why those two fingers are bandaged together, and it's because of the rough nature 
nature of the Citadel de Namur that he's actually feeling those vibrations come through his hand. He'll be all right once he gets over the top. Well, it's certainly a hard way to climb a hill in the Tour de France, that's for sure. The gap at 6.19 at the moment. It's been up to exactly eight minutes and it's uh, hovering now. It's been holding around six, six and a half minutes for quite some way. Michael Morkoff here has certainly made an impression on this year's Tour de France. He's been a professional for eight years, uh, but all of his victories have come on the track. Now he's a full-time road racing cyclist. No, he certainly is, and uh, he's a, a good rider, as we've seen over the past, and he's looked for this breakaway. It's so important in the first few days of the Tour de France to try and get a bit of glory for the team, because once you've got some publicity, the team then feels as if they've paid back the sponsors, and they've, uh, they can uh, have a little bit more relaxed approach to the rest of the Tour. Just look at the crowd here on the zigzagging climb up to the Citadel, which has a keeper on the top, uh, and an arboretum uh, for all of the uh, greenery up there as well it really is a beautiful part of Namur in Belgium as they continue to go round the cobbled roads here twisting and turning corkscrewing their way up to the summit Morkoff is doing all of the work and I presume he's not expecting the French to come around him uh, before he crosses over the summit and gets the one point and they did well done so Morkoff now if you've got any sense Michael you'll now stop racing and go and wait for the bunch well, that would be the idea, but when you've got six and a half minutes advantage, I'm not sure the team management will allow that to happen, as the main field now are also about to start the climb of the Citadel. So the peloton, well, they're, at the, uh, they're just on the outskirts of Namur here as they start to cross the town, so they're quite a little way behind. They're heading down the side of the river at the moment. No big rush here amongst them at all. There's a situation now in the uh, mountains competition. As Paul Sherman has said, big day tomorrow with a lot of small hills coming before the finish in the last quarter of the stage. So it's going to be an interesting race, our uh, first full day of racing in France. Tomorrow's a race to boulogne sur mer you can see the main field there uh, they're taking it easy over this climber they're pretty happy with the fact uh, to, i think today a lot of the teams the sprinters are sharing the pacemaking at the front end of the main field right in the middle there bobbing his shoulders in the black uh, shoulders you can see there is jens Voigt, and not too far away from him that the yellow jersey fabian cancellara well one thing's for certain now andre greipel on the lotto team has put a rider up on the front to set tempo that's the indication he is looking for the sprint victory today sat here at the back is Luis Leon Sanchez we left him on the road a nasty crash yesterday and it looks as though he's got a problem on his left side of his hand there Paul yeah, he's riding with this little splint there as well uh, as um, I, uh, my Tony Martin here this afternoon the Citadel of Namur Vauban 1692 and that refers to the designer of the Citadel it was built in 1692 and today of course the Tour de France goes by in 2012 yes, well even the Tour de France didn't exist in 1692 it all began in 1903 the Belgian flags indicating the wind. We're riding virtually due west all day today. Luis Leon Sanchez, a popular bike rider, and uh, was unlucky to crash yesterday. And he looks like he's suffering today. He's just hanging on to the tail of the peloton uh, with that left hand strapped up. And as Paul has said, Tony Martin also apparently has broken his scaphoid in his left hand, and he has a plastic cast on his hand because he wants to at least make the first time trial. He is the time trial world champion. Yeah, that's a nasty little bone fill just on the inside of the wrist and it gets broken quite a lot when athletes go down, cyclists especially, because you land on your hand and it just pops that thing. It is, it doesn't actually restrict the ability to move your hand that much, but it is extremely painful as an injury. Yeah, most certainly is. Uh, the peloton though, still no pressure on. In fact, the time slipping out just a little bit at the moment. Uh, uh, going up the cobble climb of the Citadel. Our computer showing 6 minutes 11 seconds, uh, which is about right at the moment. Yep, they're pretty much uh, over the top of the climb now. That's uh, been sorted out. And uh, fortunately enough, uh, in the uh, advert break, Phil, I was, managed to, I was able to get the phone on and had a quick call back to Team Sky. And uh, we uh, saw a little while back that Mark Cavendish uh, stopped at the side of the road and uh, there was no panic on board where he is wearing number 103 in his world championship jersey he's not panicking at all he's waiting for the team car to come up alongside him he's discussing the problem with them and uh, as we saw the, tar the car stop he left one bike at the side of the road and uh, took over the brand new bike and decided to clear off on that well I got on the phone to Sean Yates who is the team manager of two Team Sky and he's actually in the car and he told me the reason for the bike change was that Cavendish's saddle was slipping down so what it was doing was in fact lowering his position on the machine 
And it's not been a great day for Mark Cavendish because earlier on in the stage he actually had to change his shoes as well. But that to me is the sign of a man who's nervous and he wants to make sure that everything is absolutely perfect to try and come out and get himself the stage victory at the end of the day. Talking of shoes there reminds me of a funny story, although it wasn't probably funny for Greg LeMond a few years ago when he rode the Tour of Italy, the great uh, American uh, three-time winner of the Tour de France, arrived very, very wet, his shoes were soaking wet and the landlady of the hotel thought she would dry his shoes in the oven and of course she cooked them and he was in, they had to get a cobbler out of bed and make him new shoes during the night because he'd literally cooked his shoes. Well those were the days Phil when the shoes were completely made of leather and when they uh, got right. very wet at the end of the day they ended up being like a pair of slippers <laughs> rather than a pair of shoes. Yes and Greg LeMond was very very particular about his shoes they were always handmade uh, to suit his feet. Anyway wandering around the centre of Namur here at the citadel itself and the uh, centre of the chateau here that's actually the belfry of Namur it was built in 1388 and it was uh, originally part of the city walls and the tower became a belfry in 1746 when we get to the finish line by the way the belfry or the clock tower in uh, in Tournai the finish line here is the oldest one in Belgium it's referred to as the onion shaped dome quite uh, obviously for obvious reasons there these are the leaders now on today's stage of the Tour de France they got away and came together at round about 15 miles into the stage the first attacker was Anthony Rue the other who joined him. Uh, the target has been achieved by Michael Morkov um, with a lead of six minutes. He's just riding with these riders, but really he's got to be careful. He had a long, long breakaway of 120 miles in the lead yesterday, and he finished four minutes behind the race at the end. So he mustn't have tired himself out, that is for sure. Yes, and in fact, the medical report for Sanchez said he had a problem with the right side, and that was clearly on the left side, so that wasn't quite right. But back to the car. Now, the words of advice from the Saxo Bank uh, team car here, telling him the situation. He looks cool about it. Michael Morkoff, earlier today, he got the one point available in the King of the Mountains. He keeps his lead tomorrow. A lot more climbs on the road to Boulogne tomorrow. It's quite a hilly area, believe it or not, on the edge there of the uh, Channel coastline. Christoph Kern. He's riding through here nicely. His well, wife gave birth to Tom a couple of days ago, first child. Team manager in the uh, team car for Team Saxo Bank, uh, Dan Frost, a former very good track rider. And he will be happy because for a team, Phil, if you get just one of the jerseys in the first week of the Tour de France, it gives the team an awful lot of publicity. Not only is it different to the normal jersey that the riders would wear during the course of the event, it's something that gets picked up by the television cameras very easy. Whether it's the polka dot jersey, the yellow jersey, the green jersey or the white jersey, it attracts attention and that's what sponsorship is all about absolutely through the plane trees now blue skies above but the official weather forecast is it got a 75 percent chance of rain before the riders get to the finish where local time will be around 5 30 in the afternoon but at the moment things are looking good and uh, pretty routine but i think the way they're racing paul they're looking to bring this breakaway back before we get to that sprint point along the route Looking down on one of the beautiful chateaus which abound in this region. This is the Chateau de Corrois and it looks to be in perfect condition. So as we look now at the peloton here, they really are beginning to step on the gas now. The gap is at 5.03 and that the all of the teams who have visions of winning today with their sprinter have now put men into the chase at the front of the race and that's uh, that's to be expected i think uh, right now as uh, so once again we pass through uh, yet another chateau here one of the abbeys the abbey of uh, villiers which was uh, first built in 1146 yeah but this ma this uh, old abbey that we're looking at here Phil was completely rebuilt in fact in the 13th century and in its heyday the abbots with high function from the Cistercian order lived here about a hundred monks lived here and 300 lay persons to look after them it stood in those days in 10,000 hectares of land and to convert that into old money that's 25,000 acres yes and it's home to the strict observance too of the Trappist monk here and um they wear white tunics and black scapula with a leather belt worn over that tunic but uh, I think the roofs in need of renovation well it was renovated in the 13th century so it lasted for quite some time 
Well, there we are, the man in green uh, on loan from Fabian Cancellar, the man who won yesterday, Peter Sagan, and uh, taking on food today. The quiet man, he's smiling at the moment, and uh, he really is uh, always let his legs uh, do the talking. He does speak pretty good English, but he's working so hard on his Italian these days that he doesn't actually, he's losing his English a little bit. But this is the moment as well. One of them has worn the green, so centre right there was uh, Stuart O'Grady just passing through. Look at the workload of the chase sprinters teams now lotto lotto 48 percent that's the riders at the front setting the pace uh, it looks as though lotto's doing most they're riding for andre greipel team argus shimano 41 percent they're riding for marcel kittel and olica green edge putting in just 11 percent at the moment for matty goss meanwhile up front here we have these three riders out front uh, the gap is coming down all of the time Paul, as we look at these three riders here, uh, don't forget Olika Greenheads, the Aussies who have on that team Matthew Goss, himself a stage winner this year in the Giro d'Italia. He's never won a stage of the Tour de France. He is a rider who wants to deliver for his brand new team because the Aussies have never had a team in the Tour de France before. Well, I disagree with you there when you say he's never won a stage in the Tour de France. Maybe he's not gone across the line in first place, but uh -huh. he's been instrumental in making Mark Cavendish or helping Mark Cavendish to win a lot of the stages that he won. Now, now a lot of the Australians, like a lot of the British riders before them and a lot of the Americans before that, they wanted to have a national team, if you like. And that's what finally, after Team Sky has done for Great Britain, that's what Orica Green Edge has become for the Australians. And for a couple of riders like Robbie McEwen, it made him ride an extra six to eight months on his career because he actually wanted to be part of that experience. Stuart O'Grady riding in the Tour de France for the 16th time wanted to be part of that Australian uh, team going through to the Tour de France. And yes, they do want to win they've got a great sprinter in Matty Goss a former winner of the one day classic uh, Milano San Remo 36 kilometers an hour well, we're legal this afternoon only just we got smiles and sadness on that sign <laughs> but finishing off it, it's a it's a great concept and it's it's good for the Australian riders to have something to aim for when you bear in mind there's about a hundred Australian professional cyclists scattered across the globe absolutely well, as you rejoin us for two of the leaders, it is all over. Markov and Kern have just been picked up after being in the lead for nearly four hours today. But the one man who has decided to keep on going, and this is how it happened moments ago, they realised they were being caught. And uh, Anthony Roux, who started the breakaway right at the front here after just 13 miles today, and we're only 18 from the finish, remember, of a 129-mile day. The other two did not really resist and uh, Anthony Rue has gone on by himself. He's the most experienced rider here, along with Christoph Kern, I guess. It's his third tour as Rue goes clear. And, it's, and now we go back live and he's still out in front, but it is only delaying the inevitable, I'm sorry to tell Anthony. His best finish came last year, he was 101st overall. The peloton then have swept up all bar Anthony Rupaul. As long as they can see him, they'll leave him out there to run out of gas, I think. Yeah, because having been at the front of this race field for such a long period of time, to put it into perspective, he will probably be able to hold on to an average speed of about 45 kilometres an hour, which is 27, 28 miles an hour. But the main field, when they get angry on the running towards the finish, they will have an average speed of 60 kilometres an hour, which is 40 miles an hour. They will gobble him up. Well, here he is. He doesn't look as though he's in pain from that wrist, but he clearly is because whenever he tries to pull on the handlebars, he winces. And we saw him climb up the Mur Citadel uh, with one hand, literally, because the cobblestones were causing too much of a vibration uh, through those. So it's not his wrist, it's actually the two fingers. I think they were dislocated and they've now been taped together, and so they're very painful. Well, Phil, you know, if you can continue in the Tour de France, it's the only event I think in the world that you really would want to. It's almost uh, to put it comparison on it as if you were trying to climb uh, Mount Kilimanjaro or you're trying to climb Mount Everest you don't want to get to the top and say oh, I think I'll go back and come back another day it is such a pinnacle of the sport yeah. it's the only one that really motivates guys to have the courage to carry on well this has been a long long day in the saddle for Rube breaking away soon after the start today he was joined by Morkov and Kern they've gone back in the pack now 
they'll do their best to finish in the pack if they can when Morkov got caught yesterday he actually lost four minutes and he was only caught in the last three miles of the day and he still lost four minutes well it's a, it's a hard thing to do and you've got to be careful that you don't get taken into the uh, enthusiasm of uh, youth when you come to a race like the Tour de France because you've got to pay for this energy sometime down the line you've got to make sure you conserve that energy you've got to try and recover and recuperate as much as you can and uh, to throw in what uh, I was always told by the team manager the way to win the Tour de France is in bed and that means by every time you get back to the hotel you lie down you sleep you recover there's no running around there's no playing on the computer you got to sleep and rest as much as possible and if you go to bed one hour a day earlier than your opposition that's a full day sleep at the end of the three-week tour well that explains exactly why you didn't win the Tour de France Paul because you're always going to bed so late 48 seconds is the gap 26.9 kilometers to go the coming together of the peloton again often split up uh, by these little uh, traffic islands and roundabouts but now we're all together again and that the riders will only be concerned now about the location of a their team leader who's looking for a win in the Tour de France and b their team sprinter to see if they can take him to the finish in Tournai it is a super sprint in Tournai a sweeping left hand bend brings them to the last three or four hundred meters dead straight up to the finish yeah and there's not too much uh, in the way of uh, traffic furniture either on the running towards the finish because they're big wide boulevards there's a couple of sweeping bends in between the, the third and fourth kilometer to go to the finish a couple of traffic circles inside of the last two kilometers but they've got it very well buried off and they're nice wide boulevards in fact we circumnavigate navigate the cathedral of notre dame de tournée but the riders won't get to notice that they'll be concentrating with white knuckles as they race up towards the possibility of a stage win time we've been racing now coming four and a half hours and he this man's been in the lead for four of those hours and he's still uh, defying capture it's only well said Steve we'll see what Mark Cavendish can do this is a cracking race with a lot of terrific sprint finishes today and a lot of unknown quality like Kittel and Sagan and still he goes but it's not the time to look over your shoulder 37 seconds 35 seconds now is the gap the peloton are massing once they pick him up Paul we are going to see a lot of aggressive riding in this group yep that's 35 well it's down to almost 30 seconds Phil that's not much more than 500 meters or 500 yards if you like in old money when they get into these big long straightaways or the big long boulevards they can actually see the man that they are chasing and the guys doing the pacemaker at the front they won't be flat out right now they're riding about 90 percent of their maximum they will wait until the last possible moment to really put the hammer in and then pull this man back into the fold they've moved out the red car that's the race referee so the peloton right now phil can actually see anthony rue and they can judge how long they want to leave him out there before they catch him under 20 kilometers just that was the banner over the road now 12 miles from the finish the boys in black of team radio shack have dragged their fabian cancellara in yellow back to the front here to just show us this man can do most things we have seen cancellara spoil the sprinters day in compiègne a couple of years ago when he got to the front and he didn't wait for the sprint he beat them to the line easily there was a couple of tricky little corners on the run into the finish on that occasion and throw in a few cobblestones to make the recipe yeah. right nice and interesting and he took advantage of a last minute acceleration they all went wow where did that come from but it was too late by the time they figured out who it was he'd won himself the stage yes he most certainly did and he'd won it wearing the yellow jersey dead center in the white with sky on it that is Edvard Boysenhagen who got to almost the win yesterday and he's only one second that's all he's looking for to become the leader of the white jersey competition there is the white jersey of the race leader on the day at the moment and that is Anthony Rue and there is the pack now this is another angle for you in the distance you can see them now shoulder to shoulder of the road this rider is getting on with his job he knows it's inevitable he is not dreaming of a stage win today 15 seconds that's 250 meters is the distance between Anthony Rue he has done a great job of getting his team lots of publicity this afternoon at one time he he probably thought there could be a surprise they could outwit the sprinters but there are so many sprinters in the race Phil there are so many sprinters teams there's a powerful lobby of riders who want to make sure that we charge into Tournai all together
25 years of age, uh, Anthony Rue, just a couple of months ago. Well, I think it won't be all in vain today because the way he's ridden with that injured hand, his left hand, and the way he's ridden away from his breakaway rivals, the race jury have got to vote him the most aggressive rider of the day, and that's a nice prize for him at least. Another man who's injured at the back here, 155, Luis Leon Sanchez. We've got three guys in this race now with injured left hands. Well, the Phil, they're also thinking it's not this year's a complicated year if you're a professional bike rider because it's not just the Tour de France, it's what comes up a week after the Tour de France when everybody moves away from France to London for the Olympic Games. Mm. Guys like Luis Leon Sanchez, guys like Tony Martin, yeah, they might be injured here, but they need miles, they need kilometres of training and hard competition in their legs to think about winning the time trial in London. Absolutely right, that'll be based around Hampton Court and down through the Thames Ditton area. Uh, as we're watching here, the peloton, 17 seconds, it's all but over now. A rush on the right-hand side. There's so many teams have got sprinters here that they're all trying to line the men up on different parts of the road. But the team that comes through on the left-hand side in the last kilometre will have the advantage. You may not even notice it's a sweeping left-hander. Th this is Marcel Kittelfeld, now number 211. He should not be sitting at the back of the main field. He's been a great prolific winner last year, but when you look at that face, that's not the face of a man who thinks he's going to get the victory this afternoon. He should not this. be sitting there. Well, he must be feeling, but well, he's not feeling OK, in my opinion, but he's got teammates riding at the front, and yet he's hanging on the tail. He looked absolutely smashed there. One teammate to look after him. The peloton are coming to pick up Rue. Well, there, as you can see them spreading across the road, what's happening, Phil, is although these guys are ready to start the lead-out to charge into Tournay, they don't want to start the lead-out too soon. They make it, They want to make sure that the, te the men who make what is called the lead-out train organised, they want to have as much energy as possible left on the running towards the finish line. It's taken them four and a quarter hours to get this man back in their gun sights, but they've done it now. There is the uh, liquid gas colours centre left. They're looking for Sagan to deliver him to the line. We've got the light coloured jerseys here of the Mega Farmer quick step riders as well. They're without the top sprinter Tom Bonan. He's opted to concentrate on the London Olympics, but they could still take the day out here. Well, nervous moments. That's Denny Menchov in the red and white jersey just over to the right hand side, the left hand side there. He lies uh, high up in the overall standings. He will be mixing it in the sprint on the run down towards the finishing line here. And I really don't know how that young man at the front there, uh, Anthony Rue, is hanging on to <laughs> this advantage, Phil. But surely he will be very quickly back in the main field as we go under 15 kilometres to go. 15 kilometers nine miles from the finish as Anthony Rue is taking this race towards its final destination Tournai today they are hanging him out to dry because they're preoccupied with looking at each other to see who is going to take up the chase but bet your life they will take up the chase and they'll swamp him but it could go on for a little bit longer yet well the rider in the middle there in the pale blue jersey with the red white and blue bands around the middle that of course Sylvain Chavanel the man who dynamited the race on the run-up to the finish line yesterday. He started all of the aggression. They're looking after them, and, well, it looks to me, Phil, as if all of a sudden Argos <laughs> Shimano managed to get themselves organised because they've dragged Marcel Kittel back up to the front. Well, that is amazing. I don't know where he really looked completely tired at the back of the race, but they're probably... Maybe it's just race nerves. This is his first Tour de France. This is a very important result for him today. Everything changes on the Tour de France, including the leader of the race right now, because Peter Velic is bringing the charge up. Sylvain Chavanel it is at the moment, I think. Uh, no, it's Velic on the front. They, it's officially all together. The Tour de France goes into the last eight and a half miles all together. Now they're looking at each other. Now, this is where we're bound for now. This is the finishing line. The caravan are coming home. We'll be there shortly, and we're with you when we come back, will Cavendish win? pretty much isolated but he wants to stay at the front end of the main field what Michael Morkov has come to do is ride at the front to try and lead out for Jonathan Cantwell and then of course JJ Hayedo the Argentinian rider participating in the Tour de France for the first time everybody now is nervous they really are getting their game organized they're looking around they're trying to communicate but the noise in the main field is very difficult when you're coming into a town like this you've got the crowd shouting you've got the wheels whistling 
We are looking at the whole peloton of the Tour de France now coming into the five kilometer mark of the Tour de France. All of the sprinters are moving to the front and all of the overall leaders are trying to move to the front simply to keep out of trouble. This is a real battle to the line today as they go shoulder to shoulder. A total movement of the peloton. Another thing to do in a situation like this, Phil, is you've got to keep yourself very, very alert. You know you might not even try and touch your brakes. What you've got to do is use your arms and your shoulders. Even physical contact can slow you down at a moment like this. As long as you don't do it in a dangerous way, these guys race together throughout the whole of the year. They don't want to take somebody down. It really is amazing. The speed that we are looking at right now, Phil, we are doing about 60 kilometers an hour, which is 40 miles an hour. And Cadell Evans there sitting right in the middle of your screen is sitting comfortably at the front end of the peloton, not thinking about the sprint, but making sure that if there's an accident, he's not going to be involved in it. Hincapi, Big George they call him from South Carolina, lives in South Carolina nowadays anyway, riding like a man possessed. He again, Phil, is not thinking about stage victories, he's thinking about how dangerous it is, how the main field can split. I don't know if you saw that Skyrider go halfway down the peloton there, he almost disappeared over that crash barrier as they went right. That will have caused a lot of alteration of riders in the position. That was a tricky left-hand bend. I've just checked, Paul, they've just done a kilometre in 53 seconds. That is unbelievable, that's almost 45 miles an hour, the average speed these guys. There's Greg Henderson, the Kiwi rider, just in the middle there. He's riding in front of Andre Greipel, but all of a sudden it changes once again swamped as soon as the pace drops Cavendish is hovering around in the middle and I just noticed that Bosenhagen looks to be looking after Cavendish this afternoon Bosenhagen the Norwegian national champion on Team Sky but for the moment every time there's a lull in the pace bang a different team comes forward Lamprey now over to the right hand side in the pink and blue jerseys looking after Alessandro Pataki I take my hat off to the Arda Shimano boys in white at the front. They've lost their king sprinter, blown out the back. He's actually he is sick in Marcel Kittel. They have a stand-in in Tom Vila's, but he won't live, in fairness to Tom, with the boys in this sprint peloton here. Two separate lines now going across the road. On the left-hand side of the road, Andre Greipel's team, and we are now two kilometres. Another incredibly quick race. Paul, to win the sprint, you've got to hold on to this speed before you even start. You do. You've got to be riding at 45 miles an hour before you can kick it up to almost 50 miles an hour in that final explosion to the line the last two kilometers Phil is going to take them less than two minutes and you've got to zigzag around these nasty little roundabouts and stay in position hold your position don't even dream of touching your brakes you touch your brakes mate you will disappear from the first 15 places and be gone Lotto Bellisol have got the control third place there is the Kiwi Greg Henderson looking over the shoulder Marcus Siebert is on the front the German rider a lot of comfortably in fourth place Andre Greipel but I've noticed Bernie Eisel in there he'll be looking after Mark Cavendish it is up to Greg Henderson second in our picture at the moment to lead out uh, Andre Greipel he's done it with great success in Australia this year now can he do it here in at the Tour de France in Belgium they're now looking for the 1,000 kilometer 1,000 meter a red kite and Sargon in the green jersey has come right up into fourth place well Mark Mark Cavendish says he doesn't count Sargon today, he better start taking notice now. They've got inside the, bla the, the flag now indicating 1,000 metres to go and it's going to be less than 60 seconds and still it's Lotto Bellison have got a very good control at the front end of this main field. Battling up through on the left hand side in that white dirt jersey is Robbie Hunter looking after Tyler Farah. Cavendish is not far away now but looks to me as if Lotto Bellison have got control, that's Andre Greipel in third position. Yes but in fourth position is the green jersey of Peter Sargon and we've got Tyler Farrow trying to mix it as well. Mark, Shen uh, Mark Renshaw boxed in at the moment in the centre. Cavendish has picked up the wheel of Greipel. Now can he launch himself from it as they start going shoulder to shoulder? This is it now. Greipel is holding off his move till he has to as they go for the line. And still lost on his wheel comes Cavendish. Cavendish, can he get round his old teammate and win? A final kick by Mark Cavendish. Is the missile going to hit his target for the 21st time? And yes, he does. Mark Cavendish gets it on the line, win number 25, incredible. Well that was an amazing move there, he waited for the last moment, he didn't have any teammates to look after him, win number 21 Thank of the Tour Paul. de France for Mark Cavendish, <laughs> he's looking for 22 to be the best sprinter in this uh, great event, but amazing, that's Matty Goss diving across there to get the wheel of Mark Cavendish, the detractors of this man 
and Phil, I don't know why they don't just leave the box behind because when he has to come up to the big occasion, he knows how to do it. This is the moment. Andre Greipel perfectly led out there by Greg Henderson, but tucked into his wheel using the slipstream of the big German. Mark Cavendish waits for the right moment to launch the first kick, but this is a very special sprinter, Mark Cavendish. He's got the double sprints. He's got the double acceleration. That's Matty Goss there in third position, trying to fight up to come up alongside him. The lunge for the line. If you've been a great track rider like Mark Cavendish, you know how to time it to perfection. Yes, Mark Cavendish all smiles. His account is open again. His first win at the first attempt for him today. 21 victories now. He's one short of the top sprinter's victories, which is Andre Daragard. And Phil, what better way to win a stage in the Tour de France as the world champion with that magical jersey on your shoulders? Indeed, indeed. Well, let's have a look at the stage results here. What an incredible sprint. That man, when he launches himself, is unstoppable. He wins. Everybody gets the same time today. Andre Greipel, Matthew Goss, Tom Vilas. I take my hat off to Tom for that sprint because fourth place when he was told he had to sprint because of the sickness to Marcel Kittel. And that is uh, Vilas in the all-white jersey centre picture. But Cavendish is the one we're looking at. His final lunge to the line. There's nothing in it. He beats his ex team teammates Greipel and Goss, Goss on the right and that will be a very very pleasing victory for the world champion Mark Cavendish as he continues to uh, show the boys that when it matters he can deliver and that's his ninth victory of the year and also his 97th victory since his career started back in 2007.